Thank you everyone for joining us. Apologize for we we're having, I was having a little bit of technical um, issues uh, we're in now. So I just wanna welcome everyone to our city of Soledad Joint City Council Successor Agency Housing Authority and Successor Housing Agency Special meeting of December 13th. Uh, thank you again for all of those that are joining us, um, those that are here in the chamber and then those that are joining us via Zoom as well. So with that, I'd like to call the meeting to order at 6.08. Um, and at this time, if we can get roll call, please. Mayor Ana Velasquez. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Ben Jimenez Jr. Present. Council Member Maria Carlego. Absent. Council Member Fernando Cabrera. Here. Okay, thank you so much. So we'll move on. Um, the next item on the mayor, I just wanted to note that um, Council Member Corleho is ill so she is an excused absence okay thank you for that and then i know at the beginning i usually make sure that i um let the public know how they can participate in today's meeting so you do have different mechanisms to participate you can join the meeting via zoom you can join us in our chambers but you can also join the meeting via zoom um and the uh, meeting id for today's meeting is 872 you can also join um, by telephone, and the number is 1669-900-6833, which is the same number that we use all the, all the time. And just again, if you're joining us via Facebook, please note that any comments made there are not going to be reflected or recorded as part of the meeting minutes. Um, you do need to join the Zoom to make any comments. So with that, then we will move on to Pledge of Allegiance. And if I can ask our Mayor Pro Tem to lead us on the Pledge of Allegiance, please. All together, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, and that's any additions or modifications to the agenda. There are no additions or modifications to the agenda. Okay, perfect. So we will move on up to our next item, and it's public comments. So at this time, any member of the public may address the city council on items um, not appearing on the agenda, but items of interest to the city of uh, Solidan within the jurisdiction of the council. So I will open it up for those that are joining us here in our chambers. If there's any public comments, and then I will take it out to those that are joining us via Zoom. Any public comments at this time from those in our chamber? So, so I know there was a question um, in regards to how many public com the public comment portion. So it's going to be one pu one public comment. Okay, that's great. Um, good afternoon, Mayor Velasquez, City Council, and members of the public. What we witnessed last week was an embarrassment. You had the opportunity to end the chaos and start the reconciliation process with the community by rescinding Ordinance Seven Sixty Five. Instead, we witnessed. Council Jimenez throw yet another temper tantrum over a letter he received a year ago, proving yet again he was unable or incapable of moving on. This is sad and quite embarrassing. And Councilwoman Corralejo, who sits on that dais without a single vote from the community, demanded to hear from 100% of the voters. Can someone please inform the Councilwoman that, he, that even she only received 935 votes in her run for mayor? But from her place of privilege, and yes, privilege, because that seat was given to her by the previous administration, she dares to question the validity of the referendum, calling into question whether the signatures from your constituents are valid. Let me tell you who signed the referendum. High school students who have recently turned 18, registered, and are yet to participate in the first election, whose vote will be diluted should you have your weight. An 89-year-old 80, man who has had injections in his eyes and is nearly blind, that as he signed the petition, he declared that he never thought he would experience voter suppression in his town. And that of a lady who was hooked up on dialysis, but she wanted to make sure her signature was counted on that petition. Those 1,300 signatures you so arrogantly think you can so easily discredit are voters. Many who let us know they once supported both of you and are very disappointed with your actions. And we will remember your actions on Wednesday night. 
You both know that Soledad doesn't want working in 765 come March 5th. We'll only prove that all these months, what we would prove what in all these months you have desperately tried to deny. We don't want the Desmus map in our city. And let me finish by reminding the city attorney that his remarks on his communications inflicted great damage to the credibility of the referendum. Gina Martinez, the registered voter, said the full check seized upon determination of the requisite number of signatures. This information is also provided to the city to include in their request for review of signatures to ensure all parties know what to expect. And each consecutive signature was reviewed until a sufficient number of signatures was reached. For the city of Solidar, 1,393 signatures were entered into the election management system for review, 862 signatures were being valid, and 257 were deemed not sufficient, not invalid not sufficient. Ultimately, a total of 1,119 signatures were examined. Council Cabrera was correct, and you abruptly interrupted him. Many of us may question your motives. Please be more careful next time. Thank you and good night. Do we have any additional public comments? Good evening, Council. This is Valenzuela, Community Engagement Manager. I'm just here to uh, pass out this flyer and say congratulations uh, to the City of Soledad. We have received a grant from T-Mobile, the Small Town Grant, one of uh, 25 communities that received it. And so just wanted to make sure that, you know, folks in the community that are listening in uh, got to hear that. And, you know, if you can join us uh, this Saturday, Cookies with Santa, there'll be a, a, a big surprise there as well. So I'll pass these out to you. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll be making another announcement at the end. Also, we're well, just inviting our public for him. Okay. Any other comments from those that are joining us um, in our chamber? Okay. Um, any uh, public comments from those that are joining us via Zoom? Okay, so I see not, no hands raised. Uh, so we will end the public comment portion. Um, can we have any written public comments, like Kayla? Okay, no written public comments, so we'll move on to our next item, and that is the Youth Council. And so tonight we'll have the introduction of the Youth Commissioner. So I will turn this over to the Youth Commissioner. <laughs> Good afternoon, Council. I'm Mary. Uh, my name is Rodrigo Chavez. I'm one of the two Youth Council Commissioners uh, elected to be a part of this program. Uh, sadly, my partner Liliana Negrete was unable to join us tonight as she is preparing to actually make history at the high school uh, as cheer captain uh, as they are going to be a part of the competition on it. Uh, so moving on, uh, I just want to start off by thanking you guys for the opportunity, you know, growing up in Soledad, especially from an immigrant family. It means a lot to be able to have a voice and um, have a platform to express what you're feeling in our community. Right now, we're currently working with uh, Jesus to canvas out to um, people in the community for the general plan. Uh, we want to hear as much feedback as we can to reassure that everybody's voices is being uh, put into uh, acknowledgement. And following that, we're also going into our initiative as a youth council. So we hope to elaborate with that uh, alongside you guys uh, and just hope for the best in the future. So thank you guys so much. Thank you, Rodrigo, for that. And we look forward to um, just hearing more about the initiatives um, as you guys put, prepare those. And thank you for working also and canvassing for the general plan. I know as elected officials, this is a really critical um, plan. It happens every 20 years. Um, and it's really important to be able to look at 20 years how the city is going to develop. So you guys have a say in that. And it's amazing that you guys are getting involved in one of the major critical documents for all cities. So and for us, for the city of Solidarity. So thank you. Of course, thank you guys. Uh, Chair, um, I just wanted to also mention that Rodrigo um, put in an application to serve as the youth um, representative um, for the Measure S committee. Um, yes, so. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Rodrigo, for putting in that application to be able to serve in a different capacity. Yeah, thank you. Through the chair. Um, like to welcome Rodrigo and in, in a sunny time to go ahead and, and take a look how the process works. 
all the time. It's it's not just always you know uh, cherries and ice cream, and yeah. that can it can be uh, a little bit uh, challenging at times. But the main thing is that that you see the process, you get you get an opportunity to see it firsthand and participate in it. So we're excited to have you. We're excited that you're a product of our community. And eventually we know we'll, you'll end up seeing you as a leader, one of our leaders of our community or others. So welcome. Yes. Thank, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. So Council Just, Member Thank you so much for participating. We need a lot more people like you that want to be part of that, that program um, government and, and any agency that we have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, we'll move on to our next item on our agenda, which is, I really just stuck a candy in my mouth. <laughs> okay. It's our consent calendar. And today we have three items on our consent calendar. Um, so I let me um, ask the public if there's any members of the public that like to pull an item from the consent calendar for discussion or comment. And I'll open it up to those that are here in the chamber. Okay, seeing none, then those that are joining us via Zoom. Okay, seeing none, then I will um, bring it back to the council. I do want to pull one item just, just for um, uh, uh, more, just for information, um, item C-3. So I'll entertain a motion for C-1 and C-2. Or council members, is there any members of the council that want to pull an item for discussion or comments? I'll make a motion. We uh, adopt our consent calendar one and two. Okay, I have a motion on the floor. I uh, second the motion. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any okay? Any abstention? Okay, so motion carries. Um, I just on my on the item for C three. Um, I know that there's a lot that we've been doing in regards to um, a lot of work that's that's needed for um, the city. We obviously have a lot of great things happening, but just wanted to hear a little bit about. Um, I know we're, this is a contract with Harrison Associates, um, and we have an existing one already. Um, but just wanted to hear because I know we also have EMC and we also have other planning um, groups. So just wanting to make sure that we're. Um, you know, some of the specific work that's going to be done here is like more specific for Harrison Associates as opposed to some of the other groups that we already contract with. Yeah, so we, we already um, initiated a contract with them to look at the uh, work related to the Front Street uh, properties. Um, and they have been um, doing um, the work. And what happened was um, when we did soils investigation, we identified some uh, things that would require a more detailed environmental review and also uh, require phase two for soils re um, review and analysis and some soil screening. So the addition is related to both having to do a mitigated negative declaration for the uh, the project, which would include the shipping container project and then looking and doing the soils investigation. Um, we didn't know at the time that this would come up until we did the phase one soils uh, review. So that's basically why the additional um, add on. And this will really help us um, redevelop those properties, which I know um, council has taken a, a leadership role in um, really revision, uh, re envisioning what can be done to those properties to really activate uh, and create a very synergistic downtown. So this will get us that much closer and we're using ARPA funds um, for that have been delegated for this project. Okay, great. Thank you. So Megan, so just to clarify then, the obviously with the environmental, there was additional work that needed to be done. And now this is gonna get us to that complete the phase two analysis that's needed so that we in the, in the future, any future, I mean, and obviously we have already um, some discussion in terms of what we wanna see there, but it'll get us with the clearance for environmental. Yeah, so it will, because the mitigated negative declaration will allow us to start redeveloping the sites. And then uh, obviously the soil um, testing is part of that process. And so yeah, we would be able to move forward. It would get us a step closer to being development ready. But thank you for that. So with that, um, I will move to approve item C-3. Second. 
Okay, so I have a first and a second, a motion on the floor. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so motion carries. Thank you. So we'll move on then to the next item. And we have a public hearing today. Um, so I will, for the public hearing, what we're gonna do is we're gonna receive the staff report. Um, I'll open up the public hearing uh, for comments and, um, for comments, and then I'll close the public hearing and then we'll bring it back to, uh, for council action. And today is a public hearing number one on resolution number 6024, a resolution of the city council of the city of Soledad approving a tentative subdivision map to subdivide 11.29 acres of land. Um, and they, they have the different APN number to create a total of eight lots located in the southeast corner of Nestles and Los Coches Road. And I will turn this over to our associate planner, Ariane. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Council Mayor. Um, I'll be providing a brief staff report regarding the approval of the tentative subdivision map for the solid and marketplace. Um, so to facilitate, facilitate the continued development of the solid and marketplace shopping center, which is located on the corner of Nestles and Los Coches, an application was submitted um, <clears throat> to subdivide seven parcels to eight parcels, which would modify the size and arrangement that um, you see in the staff report that is provided, and I'll show shortly. Um, this application is started by the developer at Retail California, John Lee with Retail California and San Benito Engineering. Um, this shopping center had previously, previously had a subdivision map, but due to new ownership and a new um, uh, reconsolidation of the parcels, um, the owner is moving forward with a new tentative map. Um, so this was first approved in 2007 and is now bringing, uh, which was then amended in 2018. And on November 30th, it was brought forward for presentation for a public hearing at the planning commission meeting um, for consideration and discussion. Um, at this time, uh, we recommend that city council approve the tentative subdivision map um, uh, since it's been fully, uh, it's in compliance and I'll get into more details with our current zoning uh, ordinance, our subdivision ordinance, as well as consistent with our 2005 general plan. Um, as mentioned, the proposed tentative map is consistent with the general plan, which is general commercial. Uh, we do have uh, some economic development policies in our general plan, which uh, are provided under policy L21, L23, and L26. In addition, it's also consistent with the circulation element of the general plan, keeping a level of uh, service of B um, under the subdivision. For our zoning ordinance consistency, um, we see it's zoned highly commercial. All the uses that are currently proposed in the conditional use permit are um, approved under the highly commercial zoning district. Um, and in the case the developer wishes to add more uses, he does have to go through the discretionary review period with the conditional use and amend his current CUP, um, which, all of this information is being taken into consideration as he, uh, the developer, um, amends his current CEP. Um, <clears throat> again, to the special note here is that the shopping center is partially developed. Uh, majority of the public improvements are already in place. Therefore, um, the main focus is to make sure that the current lots are um, consistent with the subdivision ordinance. This means current lot sizing um, and um, uh, making sure the lots that are currently presented do not interfere with any traffic on-site circulation. This would uh, be in compliance with the Solid Ad Subdivision Ordinance, Chapter uh, 16, Tentative Map, um, which is a, it's a process designed to ensure that street alignments, drainage, uh, sanitary facilities, and locations conform with city regulations, which currently um, as new projects come, the city still reviews those items to make sure they're all in compliance. Um, regarding CEQA, um, this project is covered under a mitigative negative declaration back in 2007 when this project was initially proposed. Therefore, some of the conditions in the tentative map um, are provided with the MMRP, meaning that those are conditions that are, uh, serve in effect to the mitigative negative declaration. So those are conditions the developer has to move forward with uh, in order to comply with the environmental analysis. Um, right now, let me show 
briefly a um the parcel map. So ultimately, this is the parcel map that um, that we are being considering for approval. Um, it ultimately cleans up the current subdivision um, where um, the developer is able to move forward with leasing negotiations um, and help this development uh, move faster um, in construction. Um, so that's what the current subdivision would looking would be looking like. We have the lot split going down in equal parts here, as well as lot splitting, lot splitting this way. So that's just something important to consider. And a site plan was attached on the staff report um, for council review and consideration. Um, lastly, staff is seeking city council action to approve resolution 6024. Um, based that the new tentative map is necessary to accommodate the applicant's request um, for size and lot reconfiguration from the seven to the eight parcels. Um, the access and internal circulation would be kept the same um, as provided in the site plan. And then um, it's again mentioned that it's important for commercial leases as it helps commercial developers understand what is conditionally approved. So those conditions of approval that are provided in exhibit A have are the same ones that were provided back in 2007. They would just be moving forward in addition to um, the conditions that are underlined, which um, it's a little clearer regarding the title reports of the property. So that's something to consider that um, staff added to the conditions of approval. Um, that concludes my presentation. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Okay, Th thank you, Ariana, for that. So uh, before I bring it to the council. Let me make sure that I take it out to the public first to see if we have any comments from the public, and then I'll bring it back to see if there's any comments or uh, questions from the council. Okay. Um, oh, no. So at this time, I'm going to open the public hearing. I'm going to open the public hearing at 6.30 on this item, and I will take any comments uh, or questions from those that are joining us here in our chambers. Okay, seeing none, then I will take um, I will take it out to those that are joining us via Zoom if there's any questions or comments on public hearing number one. Okay, seeing none, then I will close the public hearing at 6.30 and I will bring it back to the council for questions first and then we can, um, if there's no questions, then we can move forward with council action. Any questions from the council? Yeah, I just have a quick clarification, and I, I think you said it already, Ariana, but just to be able to understand, um, under the CEQA, there is no, because there are no, they're only, um, the the lot split is only in regards to the size or smaller, and mm -hmm. then the arrangement is different, configured differently, but there's nothing that will impact um, the CEQA, so it doesn't have to go back to environmental review, any of that, right? That is correct. Yeah, yeah. so um, it's just a lot size re reconfiguration. Um, and based that some of the conditions of approval under Exhibit A um, are added uh, in in order to make, mitigate significant, um, <clears throat> potential significant effects, um, those conditions were added. So the developer is, whenever a project is proposed, we have to look and make sure he's in conformance or else then something, another environmental analysis can be triggered. Okay. Yeah. And then once we have projects that are coming forward, they have to go through the CUP process. Additional uh, uses, yeah. Additional so uses under the CUP, it. which was provided, I think it was not provided here, um, only the tentative map conditions of approval, but the current conditional use permit, the subject or the marketplace has, it already lists um, approved uses. When a developer would like a new use added that is not within that list, he would have to go through the discretionary. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So, so council, uh, I'd like to entertain if there's uh, like to entertain a motion. For I'll make a motion. We adopt uh, resolution sixty thirty four. Second. So sixty twenty four. Sixty twenty four. 
Okay, so there is a motion on the floor for adoption of resolution number 6024. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so motion carries um, unanimously. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ariana, for the work on this. Appreciate it. Okay, so we'll move on to our next item on our agenda, which is um, this new, bu new business items or business items, and we have seven of those today. So we'll start with business item number one, resolution number 6034, resolution of the City Council of the City of Soledad approving a consulting services agreement task order number one with PL Engineering to perform an engineering and traffic survey analysis in amount not to exceed $34,292. Dollars and authorizing the city manager to execute said task order on behalf of the city of Soledad. So I will turn it over to. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Megan, I think we're starting with a presentation. Yeah, um, Chair, this is a presentation and then related to the task order about the safety uh, study that is moving forward. Okay, so we'll begin with the presentation. Okay, that should work. Can we yeah. see that? Mm -hmm. All right. Again, good evening, Mayor Council, City Manager, City Attorney. Tonight we have a short presentation on citywide safety assessments and measures. And accompanying me tonight are some of the staff from the police department. And we should have Leo Trujillo with TL Engineering also uh, online. I think he's available to speak, right? Yes. Okay. So it'll be a joint presentation. We'll go through a couple of slides and we'll have people chime in as necessary. And the purpose of the presentation is to bring everybody up to date and, and respond to some recent questions regarding what measures staff has been taking uh, citywide to address safety concerns, uh, safety assessments, and measures throughout the community of Solid Ed. So over the last six months, and let me see if I can get this out of the way. Um, is that your side? Yeah. Okay, thanks, um, so over the last six months, um, staff has established an agreement for on-call traffic engineering uh, with TL Engineering for a number of services, uh, traffic and transportation related support services, uh, safety assessments, evaluations and recommendations, speed surveys, which is the topic of the next item, and always stop warrant assessments, as well as traffic counts. We've engaged in departmental coordination, including periodic meetings between engineering, public works, and police department staff to coordinate our efforts, identify areas, locations of concern, and identify priority issues, as well as identify any areas or locations throughout the community for further study. I don't know, Chief or Philip, if you wanted to add to that about our periodic meetings, we'll say anything about that. Good evening. Uh, so basically, uh, we're just here to basically give our input as far as uh, the traffic issues that we see out on the streets when we're out on patrol. Um, there's a lot of the streets that uh, I would say need work. Um, as far as putting up stop signs, uh, warnings, flashing lights, so crosswalks. Uh, maybe some of the uh, streets also need a speed zone uh, signs posted, uh, which is difficult when we're enforcing out in the streets. Um, a lot of the, uh, the semis that are parking up on Orchard Lane, uh, it's one of the biggest complaints mm -hmm. that I always get. And I try to explain to the citizens that, you know, we're working on it, um, but um, our Main concern is the safety for the public and making sure that you know people are slowed down you know, when they're out in the streets. Great. And the purpose of the meetings is to balance really, you know, what we see from the engineering public work side with the day-to-day fact that you know PD is out there every day enforcing the people in law and seeing what the safety concerns are. Thank you for that. Part of the collision data information, I'll turn it over to you, Leo, here is to brief council on what collision data has been um, collected to date. Hey, Leo, are you there? Oh, yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. 
<clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Um, as Leon said, I'm Leo Trujillo with Teal Engineering. Uh, so here on this slide, um, we'll start off with the Switters, which is a statewide integrated traffic record systems. And the Switters is managed and controlled by the CHP. Switters collects collision data from all public agencies, including towns, cities, counties, and the state, and incorporates all in one database. The data is available to everyone. TIMS is another database that collects collision data and is accessible to the general public as well. So using this data will assist and aid city staff in the decision-making process of all these safety items that are identified throughout the city. Thank you, Leo. Tasks in progress. So safety so, assessments and we're taking a citywide approach. And here, so uh, here we have some safety assessments that the city is contemplating uh, for citywide approach. Uh, staff is working on citywide matrix to list, identify, and map areas with safety concerns. So city is uh, a citywide approach will allow staff to prioritize safety concerns and locations to determine safety improvements based on available funding. Uh, staff is working to develop a citywide signing, striping, and tree maintenance program. So the, the intent of this is rather than making a, a or taking a response and react approach, at uh, the locations in question, you know, staff believes it is more efficient to first prioritize the areas of concern based on safety or other considerations. So uh, some of these other considerations that the city might want to consider while establishing uh, the database would be like the type of street or intersection that is in question, uh, the collision history of that area. Traffic volumes is a very, is it a very heavily trafficated area or intersection? And, and also the proximity to schools or areas of special concern. So you can go to the next one, Leon. And I'll hand it back Safety to you for that one. Safety assessments at specific locations have been initiated. So for example, Market Street at Amador Street by Joe Ledesma Park. Um, based on an evaluation that Leo, Chukio, at TL Engineering assisted the city with, Existing stop signs will be replaced with high visibility stop signs. Uh, police department staff will conduct educational meetings at the apartment complex near the park. There's been some issues with accidents and children crossing the street there to access the park as we understand it. And then striping will be replaced as part of a future restriping project. And the reason we have that as sort of a separate phase is because we are working to establish a citywide restriping signage program so that we get better bids, do it in a manner that's more efficient and more cost effective for the city. And typically you do that when you have larger areas or larger quantities of strike inner signage to replace or redo. But the first two items immediate steps to improve safety at that particular location. And another safety assessment that uh, TL Engineering assisted with was the Alley of Gayer Park. Uh, discussion of potential safety improvements were discussed with engineering, public works, and police department staff. And the next step is to determine where these improvements fall in the city's safety priority list. Next item is speed surveys. So we determined that the existing speed surveys within the city of Soledad are out of date, and new current speed surveys are needed in order to identify the appropriate speed limits on roadway segments and in order to enforce them. Speed survey locations have been identified and mapped. There's the exhibit showing where the locations are going to be done. And data collection for speed surveys is currently underway. A speed survey analysis to follow after data collection is complete. And Leo, can you give us a sense of where that process is at this point in time? Yeah, so the uh, data collection for the speed survey was completed at the end of last week. They're processing the data this week and I think they should uh, we should have the data available sometime next week. Thank you, Leo. And then Leo, I'll turn it over to you for the always soft warrant assessments. If you can talk about the three locations and then what the criteria are for always soft warrants. Sure. Yeah. So uh the three locations are uh Monterey Street and Benito Street, San Vicente Road, Gavilan Drive, and Orchard Lane and Ventura Drive. We actually were there yesterday at, at the city uh, doing the uh, site distance assessment for all three locations. Um, we have all the data and we're about halfway done on all the three uh, warrant studies. And so there are six different criteria that are checked for in each one of these uh, warrant studies. The first one is the volume warrant, which is basically the overall traffic volume and delay of the intersection. Second one is the collision history. 
basically the California MUTCD requires that a minimum of five correctable accidents uh, be present uh, in any 12 month period. And so we check for that. Uh, left turn activity is the third one. So basically do left turn movements experience delay uh, due, to, uh, due to the heavy uh, vehicle movements and conflicts. Next one is a vehicle pedestrian conflicts uh, similar to the last one. So uh, do vehicles or pedestrians experience delay uh, due to the conflict? Uh, fifth one is sight distance, which I discussed a little bit earlier here. So uh, basically does the intersection meet uh, the Caltrans sight distance standards? And the last one is similar streets, uh, which is actually the case for the Monterey Street and Benito Street intersection because th both of those uh, streets are very similar in nature, same width, same um, uh, you know, striping configuration, one link per direction. So in those situations, we check for whether the street segments are similar to each other and, and whether that criteria is met as well. Yeah. Other common measures, and you know, if you'd like to continue with this slide, and I think the next few slides are examples of some traffic home measures. Sure. Yeah, so here we have, uh, we're going to talk about a few traffic common measures that can be implemented at the various uh, locations throughout the city. Uh, so the process for evaluating and implementation, first review the geometrics, review collision history, uh, review traffic volume data if available, and uh, another item that's not included here then we should also consider is proximity to schools or areas of special concern, right, and, and mark them higher on the priority list. So then based on those items, then you know, make recommendations for appropriate traffic, com traffic calming uh, devices if they're found to be necessary. So here's a list, a brief list of traffic calming measures. It, there's obviously more than these, but here's a brief list of the common ones. So speed bumps, speed humps, these are typically used in more local and residential streets with a speed limit of 25 miles an hour, maybe up to 30, 30 miles an hour, but certainly no higher than that. Uh, curb extensions, also known as bulb outs, colored and textured crosswalks for high visibility. And then the next one is just high visibility striping markings and signing in general. Uh, rumble strips, uh, specifically lateral rumble strips. And we'll show you an example of these uh, here in the next few slides. Um, F is a red light enforcer device for traffic signals and used to uh, aid the police department to uh, for basically detecting people running a red light. Uh, next one is a radar speed feedback display sign. And like I said, we'll show you this in the next slide or two. And the last one is rectangular rapid flashing beacons. Thanks, Leo. And as you can see in the photo, the photo is an example of a couple of measures together. You have the curb extensions with the curb bulb outs, the color texture crosswalks for visibility. Um, that really make it apparent um, that pedestrians are gonna be crossing that uh, intersection in question. Thanks, Leo. And uh, please continue with some of these examples of uh, traffic calming measures. Sure. Yeah. So what we have here is on the left side, uh, we have an example of an intersection with high visibility striping and markings. This particular location is uh, at the, in the city of Scotts Valley, the intersection of Mount Hermon Road and Scotts Valley Drive. Uh, the one on the right is an example of, of an intersection or a location that has uh, several safety or traffic calming measures, including high visibility crosswalk. Uh, we have the refuge island and uh, sign warning signs together with the rectangular rapid flashing beacon. This one shows on the left, it shows an example of lateral rumble strips. So, so this condition is typically used for uh, when to, to warn or alert drivers of an upcoming change in speed or direction in the roadway. And an example of this, I'm sure most of you have driven on Boronda Road in Salinas, uh, heading west towards the where Costco is at. And they have those rumble strips to alert drivers that you're coming up to a very uh, tight curve. And so you need to reduce your speed. Uh, the one on the right here is a, an example of speed humps. And this is mostly used on local, like I said, local residential streets, streets that are experiencing uh, speeding issues. So here, I'm sure everybody recognizes the one on the left here in front of San Vicente Elementary School. And, it, and, and this is an example of an area that already has uh, traffic calming and safety measures 
installed. So it includes refuge island, curb extensions, broke bow belts, high visibility crosswalk, uh, warning signs, and a rectangular rapid flashing beacon. So this is an example of, of some of the items that can be implemented in other locations within the city. The one on the right is a, a radar speed feedback display sign. This is a more active method to relay speeding issues to drivers. So it is also uh, used to warn drivers of upcoming changes in speed. And I think with that, I'll hand it over to you, Leon, uh, and everybody else for questions and comments. Uh, thank you, Leo. Uh, very informative. You know, just uh, so <laughs> into the presentation. I think it's informative and educational. That's the goal of the program that we're underway. I hope, if anything, this presentation has demonstrated there's been a lot of work in the background with staff and PDE and our traffic engineering consultant to help establish and evaluate um, various measures and assessments throughout the city of Solidarity. So, good speech to ask any questions. We're that's what we're here for. Yeah, thank you, Leon, um, to be able to. Thank you for that presentation. I think part of that was also the concern by the council and various council members in regards to some of the accidents that have happened in our streets and more so, I think, this this past year than what we've seen in the past. So um, just concerns in, regard, in, in regards to that, I think, was really critical for safety reasons and what can we do. So I really appreciate all the different layers of the presentation and information. So let me um, let me take it out to the public and then I'll bring it back to the council so that if there's any questions from the public, we can get that at this time. So is there any um, members of the public that wish to make a comment on item B-1? Yes, actually, um, I do have um, questions about the yeah. hybrid dog. Can you just do me a favor? I'm sorry. Can you uh, put down your laptop? Because I can't read oh. it. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Thank you. Right. Sorry. Um, I have a question about the um, the stripping, the race stripping of the rumble strips. Are they only exclusively used to make aware of traffic pain, uh, pain in the road? Or can that be implemented as calming traffic? Because I know um, I, 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 we heard from a lot of residents <clears throat> that sound eccentric is a, um, a very problematic problematic um, area, especially during like the eight o'clock and the five o'clock time, time frame. Um, also, um, as personal experience, um, Gavilan, um, during the school hours, um, the entry and the exit of school entry times, um, there's a lot of jaywalking and there's a lot of car speeding also, and that's just not a good combination on Prado. Um, that does have a big curve and it does have a lot of um, blind sites if you're going at higher speeds. Well, I'm wondering if um, these rumble strips can um, serve as a deterrent because <clears throat> honestly, I don't believe that um, signs and uh, um, flashing lights is enough. Um, and I'd rather not, you know, um, take chances with the safety of our, our youth. I know on Bravo Street a couple months ago, I heard of a lady whose dog got not ran over um, for speed, you know, by speeding um, traffic, and that's concerning. You know, it's like that could be our kids. Um, and we see, oh, and this was also another um, concern that I have. I don't know if it was addressed. Um, please correct me. Um, the the streets they need to be more visible. The street names they need to be more visible. Um, especially for night vision. Um, a lot of these streets names are completely dark. Um, I know a couple months ago, my son actually had an idea of using glow in the dark um, paint to like uh, reflect those, um, the, the street names. But yes, that is a concern, especially if we don't, we don't know exactly how, you know, an unknown neighborhood we're driving around and we don't know the name of the streets because they're hidden blocked by trees or they're just not vis visible enough. So those are my main comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Leo, would you like to say something about the applicability of the rumble strips of the first question that I heard? Sorry, I think. <laughs> Go ahead, Leo, sorry. Go ahead, Leo, either. Leo, can you hear us? Could you repeat that, Leon? 
Uh, yeah, could you, uh, I think the first question I heard um, from the member of the public was the applicability of rumble strips. The usage of the rumble strips? Yes. It's no, yeah, so I mean, uh, okay. where we have areas of concern uh, with regards to speeding and conflicts, you know, particularly with, you know, children, like I said, you know, if, if we have a roadway that's in the near proximity to a school, that should be considered, you know, a high priority location. So uh, if there are, you know, conflicts and jaywalking happening and speeding, uh, so the combination of all these elements, you know, should warrant some type of device. I know there are already several traffic calming devices along, let's say, Metz Road, right, that goes through uh, Gabilan and and um, and uh, the elementary school, San Vicente. Um, so rumble strips could be yet another item that can be introduced, say, as it as uh, vehicles are approaching some of these uh, mid-block crosswalks, for example. And then Leo, correct me if I'm wrong, are we doing an always soft warrant on San Vicente, aren't we, at uh, San Vicente and Gabilan? Is that correct? No, no, that is not one of the ones that we're currently studying right now. Yeah, I thought we were. Okay. We discussed it. We talked about it, but um, it hasn't been included in the list yet. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Chief. And, um, yeah, one, one thing I, I want to let you folks know, um, because we keep forgetting them, uh, we're working with the schools, with the superintendents and the school board um, on their traffic issues and what the kids are telling them when they get to school. So it's been, a, it's been an all-hands-on-deck uh, kind of event here where our traffic unit, our code enforcement, um, these folks, the schools, we're all trying to figure out how to make the streets a little bit safer because um, we're getting calls all the time about, you know, San Vicente, uh, Vista and Soledad, uh, folks running stop signs and things like that. So and I think we were talking about, it might have been Vista and Soledad mm -hmm. and San Vicente where we were talking about slowing down up there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Chief, for that, um, just for letting us know the collaboration that's happening Okay, um, thank you. So let me <laughs> about the visibility of the street names. Um, Leo, I think, uh, what's the latest MUTCD standard for street name signs? Yeah, so signs uh, must maintain a certain level of retro reflectivity all the time. So, as we know, everything gets old and then they get faded and they lose their ref retro reflectivity. So, that should be just part of the uh, city's you know general maintenance to replace those signs every, you know, 10 years or whatever, you know, before they start, you know, going below the, the uh, appropriate levels. Thank you. Again, citywide maintenance plan, signing, striping, whatnot, to replace things mm -hmm. as they get with what everybody um, dissipates. Thank you. Okay, just I want to make sure that I, um, any anyone else from our public here that's joining us in our chambers, I'd like to make any comments on item D-1. Okay, so let me take it out to Zoom. If there's anyone that is joining us via Zoom that has any questions on item B-1. Okay, I see no hands raised. So then I will bring it back to the council if there's any comments or questions. And I'll start with Council Member Cabrera. Um, I, now I, I'm not sure if that is part of what you guys do. Might be also the policy, but uh, um, I've been taking my kids to school the years and there's always um traffic jumps in the school. Is there any any more creative way to to speed up a little bit like um because uh the dropping sound is always next to the school and it's a very small mm -hmm. and sometimes there's too many cars right there. So is there any way like for instance I'm thinking Jack Francis you know, Jack Francis and people have to go into the parking lot and there's a lot and that's the only way that the bus can go in. Is there any way to create? Because there is no parking zone in that in in mm -hmm. uh, in Orchard. Is there any way that we can kind of um, select that portion to for dropping students or picking up students? Mm -hmm. It's next to the. Street. Mm -hmm. uh, it's ne it's it's on the street, but it's next to the, to the sidewalk. Yeah, I mean, some of the drop off. I mean, I experience the same thing. My daughter goes to Everett Alvarez and Salinas, and I've mean, been out there for an hour. Yeah, right. it's, it's, yeah. The queue is all the way down Veranda and mm -hmm. all the way down to Creek Bridge almost. It's it's difficult, and part of it is sometimes the drop off areas are just limited in capacity, limited in space for the number of vehicles and students that are getting dropped mm -hmm. off. But it's certainly something that we can look at. 
Uh, Leo, I don't know if you have any thoughts offhand, but it's some, certainly something we can add to the list of items that we can evaluate. Because in, the, in for instance, in Main Street, I'm, I'm sorry, I just want to say add this. On Main Street, you go inside and there's there's always a line of cars dropping the, the kids, and the kids not all not they, they don't not, they don't get out right away. They wait until they get to the to the to the um the door, and then in that in that particular school there is a, a no turn to the left. Mm -hmm. So everybody has to go to the right. So is there any way that we can manage to let people go to the to the left, at least for that period of time? Well, well and part of the reason that some of the schools have one way in, one way out is because if they have different directions coming in, it'll get gridlocked, completely stopped um, with people trying to come in one way or, or come in the other way. So it's much easier for the schools if you just have a one way in, one way out, it's a little slower dropping them off. But if you have a car that's going this way and you have a car that's going this way, it blocks and stops, it completely stops all the traffic as opposed to just slowing it down. So that's why uh, Friend Jody's got the, the one way thing uh, right here on Main Street. It's got one way where you can drop them off. Um, they're not supposed to be dropping them off on the other sides of the street, you know, mm -hmm. anything like that. So we're we're trying to keep an eye on that. But one way in, one way out by the schools is, is so that's the least um, troublesome yes. um, for for traffic. So for that, I don't have a problem. But I was wondering if on the streets, on the street, on the, on the, on Orchard, that that whole line is a non-parking zone. So can we make that a drop-in? And we would have to look at that because look, it's a new school. Um, you know, over on Walker, uh, like when people are dropping off with kids or picking up kids, they're stopping actually blocking the turn lane yeah, and they have to stop in a turn yeah, lane, uh, which causes huge traffic issues because then you have cars blocking the lane, you have a car here trying to make a turn while this car is mm -hmm. so um, you know, trying to mitigate traffic by the schools. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's a delicate dance. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Obviously, that's a much bigger dialogue. I mean, obviously, we've seen all of the different impacts, and it's, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot more that can be said. But I think, in terms of just looking at what we have before us and mm -hmm. what we can do um, based on some of this information and be proactive uh, to be able to look at different mitigative factors moving forward. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Mayor Potem? Yeah, thank you. Um, some of the questions I have is, I know we have limited funding and we're looking at a, a survey. So it's about $34,000 to conduct this survey of those problematic areas. And of concern for me, and I would like to see the main focus being the schools and the surrounding areas around the schools. So the high school, uh, Benito, um, you know, San Vicente third, where you have uh, all that backing up as well, Gavilan. Uh, school right there on Mets, and again, I think I believe that's Miranda running that way. Um, you have Main Street School, which is uh runs adjacent to North, mm -hmm. however, half of them go that way, the other half go down to Sino, and then Solid Street, which is a lot, uh, a lot larger road, so therefore they pick up a lot of speed. And I understand about the figures uh, as far as the collision statistics, however. How about the dark figure of the ones that we don't know about, the near misses, the accidents that, hey, I ain't got no shirt, you got no shirts, I'm good. And we go on our way. Um, so um, I would like to see the main focus of that survey um, start with uh, the schools and the close proximity, the neighborhoods and those clocks, uh, close proximity for child safety, because that's that's really what we're mainly, mainly uh, you know, for myself concerned about at this point. And I know we'll get to the other ones. I know Orchard, they. They tend to haul down that street, for lack of a better word, haul, and then uh, up West Street as well. Uh, so we got a lot of things going on uh, in addition to uh, the street uh, paint. We need to uh, put crosswalks. We need to do those type of things because, uh, on, you know, in California now, it's not against a lot of jaywalk anymore, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, they won't be cited for that. But uh, nonetheless, uh, to address those issues, I'm hoping that's where our focus will lie uh, with that survey. Okay, well, during the presentation, I have an exhibit up. I think if everybody saw, it was a map of the city of Soledad. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, we were doing 16 uh, locations or segments as part of the uh, speed yeah, survey right. work. Yes, that's right, 16. 
and they're dispersed around the city, I think enough that they would cover any areas of decent schools. Is that correct? Say it again, I couldn't hear. I think they're dispersed enough. They're, they're, they're spread around the city in such a way that a lot of the schools are nearby the locations that the speed surveys will occur. Oh, yes. Yes. You could put a map yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. 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 Bear with me. Can I present? Um, Maybe if you could get a, a list. The we 16. Know what the, the total are. So I said okay. Gabi Lanz, okay. West, Market, Mr. Soda, yeah, Andalusia, okay, East, Entrada, Prado, Orchard, Sir, Mets, Palm, Monterey, Front. Yeah. Nestles. A little small, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you see that? That's right, I got you. Yeah, it's a little bit small. Well, I mean, the, the red dots kind of yeah. the location. And you can see the dispersion of the segments are, you know, Main Street's in there, the high school's in there, um, a lot of the schools that are in and around the San Vicente. Um, are there. So we, I think we have a good discussion. Again, this came from meeting with PD <clears throat> and getting their priority as, as to where they thought some of the uh, speed location should be done and some of the surveys should be done. And then the other element I would say is keep in mind that in the background, um, we've been working with uh, the transportation agency from Monterey County, that's TAMSI, and Ecology Action on the Safe Routes to School program. Right. And that Safe Routes to School yeah. program evaluated and conducted morning drop-off and afternoon pickup survey of all of the schools in Soledad over a period of time, talk with the teachers, talk with students, talk with the community to identify uh, those concerns and we have those mapped out in a series of proposed safety improvements. So again, the matrix that we have evaluated dates not only has the collision information, but it has the location of where uh, the safe routes to school data. Um, and again, it's all about putting these in layers and kind of laying them on top of each other and really working. We get the biggest bang for our buck, so to speak. We address like a issue related to safety concerns for our students at a school. There's also collision history. There's also an opportunity to implement um, traffic calming measures because unfortunately they're not cheap. And we've got to be smart about where we apply our dollars and where we realize improvements. That answer your question? Mostly? Well, we're going to be looking at it. And the survey hopefully will reflect that uh, and those concerns that I had with those areas. So we'll we'll take a look once it comes out. But yeah, thank you. And, and yeah, yeah. I also did want to remind council that we received a sizable TAMSI grant to address uh, complete streets on West Street. And although that's not necessarily trapping calming per se, um, you know, having a complete street does show uh, does slow traffic. So that's another thing that's actually a physical improvement that we'll be implementing. Correct. Right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Leon, and, and thank you. Um thank you as well. Um Alex, is it Alex? Leo. Oh, Leo, 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 thank you, Leo and Leo, Leo <laughs> for that presentation. Yeah, and I think for me, some of the similar comments, but I'm, you know, obviously you said there's 16 priority locations or based on collision, you have all these other, you know, factors that you're looking at. Um, and I also want to say that, you know, our police department also received a big grant uh, in terms of the traffic for um, the traffic grant that they received, right? So that is also really important to make sure that people are abiding by the speed limits, right? To make sure that um, we're not having any um, kind of collisions because of that. I guess for me, you know, thank you. Thank you for this. I know our concern obviously is safety. And I know that, um, you know, years ago, several years ago now, the city worked with San Vicente School to be able to look at what we have existing right now. And there was funding from the school that they had as well. And then funding from the city where we can pair up, I want to say, where we can pair up the money where we did some of the traffic mm -hmm. calming measures, what you showed here, but then some of the beacon lights and some of those mm -hmm. um, were really also in regards to some of the funding that the school had. So, you know, obviously our priority is the children, but also looking at those 16 locations where there's high collision rates and all these, you know, other uh, factors. But, I, but any in the school location, I just want to make sure that we're also working, and I know we're working together, but that we're looking at the opportunity for the school to be able to have grants that we can pair up with these traffic calming measures. So we have now additional funding that's needed. As you said, it's very costly. So how do we make sure that we're doing that, especially when we're working with the schools? I know San Vicente was you know an, a, an issue for many years, and that's why that happened, because mm -hmm. there was an accident. Um, and there was some deaths, you know, that happened in that corridor and 
I know because I lived off of San Vicente. My mom lives off of um of San Vicente. And I know that's still a very high traffic area. I mean, all the way out to you past the cemetery, people are speeding. And you know, in our house, someone almost ran into, I mean, ran into our fence and almost inside the living room. We're almost inside the living room if it wasn't for the fence that stopped them. But it is still very, you know. And now that we have Orchard Park there, also, and there's more traffic, so it's looking at some of those safety measures. I, I'm just concerned because I know, I mean, I'm glad that we're doing this, but I also want to make sure that we're also looking at, you know, we just had a presentation several months ago on the pavement management data system, right? Because that's another you know, element. Another element, and obviously the streets need to be safe in order for collisions not to happen. That's very costly. I guess for me, it's compiling. I want to make sure that we're comprehensive in, in the survey and that takes into consideration whatever's going to be coming back to the council is that we're looking at all these other, like you mentioned, all these other initiatives are already happening with the Tansy Complete Start or West, the traffic grant that the police department received. What is the school doing? We have the safe routes to school that we just prioritized and approved a couple of those priority areas that the parents brought before us. So that we're looking at all of these things put together and then bringing it back to what is it going to cost? And I know for me, obviously, that turns into a capital improvement project, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would hope that when you do the survey, we come back as a council in the mid-year budget mm -hmm. to be able to look at what are those 16 priority areas, locations, what existing funding do we have? What are the existing resources that we're already you know, that we're already initiatives that are already happening. So we can make a, an informed decision that is more comprehensive and not, I just feel like there's so many different layers of exactly. this. Exactly, and that's the goal again of the effort that we're doing. I mean, for example, we mentioned earlier the West Street, or Megan, you mentioned earlier the West Street Road Diet. That's actually plotted on the matrix right now so we can see where it lies in relation to the rest of the improvements. And keep in mind, for example, the Safe Routes to School, some of those point locations actually may overlap on something like a West Street project or a, another street improvement project. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right as to how to group those together in a larger project, okay, based on available funding, so we get the biggest bang for our buck. And then also leveraging the existing transportation fee um, uh, funding programs that we have, like RMRA, SB1, Measure X, and whatnot, mm -hmm. that will, based on what the program requirements are, allow us to utilize those fundings. Yeah, and my just final thoughts on that, Leon, as I know we've talked about before, like working with the schools to stagger their time. I know Selena's does it with some of the middle schools, right? You know, Washington, I think Washington starts at a later time. Right. Um, right. So it's also working with the schools to see, look, we're not, we don't have all this abundance of money, but is there other, other ways that we can mitigate some of the traffic impacts? And it may be staggering some of the school times if that's, you know, part of, um, trying to address some of those um, morning and afternoon. And then I think my last comment is just in terms of workshops and community awareness and changing, um, just, you know, it, it, if you change people's habits, that's a form of mitigating some of these, you know, traffic impacts, yeah. but that takes a lot of awareness. And so I think as we're moving on with this is, you know, really making sure that we're doing the community awareness, that we're having the workshops, that we're, letting our residents know the investment and the funding and the surveying is what it says, but also raising awareness of why this is critical to the safety of everyone in our community and the children and those that have, you know, been impacted by loss or death because of traffic collisions. Um, but I think that community awareness piece has to be really critical because as was stated, even in the school drop-offs, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's impacted everywhere and it's not just in solid net I and mean, you see it everywhere, but I think just making sure that that's a component of what we do moving forward. Okay, understood. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. No, thank you so much, um, yeah, sure. Leon and Leo. Thank you for <laughs> Leon. All for Leon and Leo for all that information and presentation, and thank you for getting us hopefully to figure out how we have some traffic safety um, mitigation in our city. Okay. So uh, thank you for uh, your comments. And um, I guess we'll roll it right into the staff report. <laughs> so the staff report before you, uh, did the item B1 is a consideration of a resolution approving a consultant services agreement task order number one with Dell Engineering to perform an engineering traffic survey, abbreviated ENTS, 
analysis and I'm not not to exceed 34,292. Um, again, you heard a lot of this for the presentation. So engineering and traffic surveys are required to support and justify speed limits on certain roadway segments. Um, the city of Soledad um, in July of 2013 performed an engineering and traffic survey, ENTS, um, that lasted five years to 2018. It was extended by the city engineer at the time for another five years to July of 2023. So technically, um, that information, that analysis has expired. And that is why there is a need to renew it. Uh, we've engaged TLM engineering. Uh, the speed limits, as you know, establish a safe and reasonable operating speed for the specific section of road, roadway, and they're governed by the California Vehicle Code. And the survey can be valid, as we described before, for a period, initial period of five years and then with extension uh, for another 10 years. So um, the scope of work includes 16 locations are presented in the uh, staff report um, on pages two and three. And again, as Bill mentioned, some of that initial data collection is already completed. So um, staff recommends that we move forward and council approve the task order. I'm happy to answer any more questions. I might, you know, a lot of the information in here was in the presentation, so I don't feel need to repeat it. Uh, Leo's available for any questions uh, regarding the scope of work. Um, that concludes the presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Leon. Um, any questions from the council? No. Okay. Um, well, thank you for that. Just my clarification on, on the, the extension. So it's five years with a 10 year extension. It's valid for a period of five years. years, and then the city engineer may extend it for another five years. Okay. So okay. 10 years total. Okay, 10 years total. But, but before it gets extended in the five year time frame, it'll come back to council, or is it an automatic? Um, just because I know that a lot of things change within the five year time frame and would it come back, Megan, for council just to review or approve or extend? So it's just a long time for a 10 year. It's, I don't think generally it would because it's more of a technical um, analysis that a city engineer would conduct, but we could always, you know, um, come back and explain why if it, if it is extended. But this one in this particular case would give us a fresh start. And Leo, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is the city engineer has to make a determination that no significant transportation or traffic changes have occurred on those segments. That's right. To extend yes, that's right. The speed limit for another five years. And I think there's a form or a documentation that you need to, the city engineer, we need to sign and stamp. Okay. But, yeah, yes. so it's based on the data, the track, the data that he discussed, the sweaters and the tins. And okay. Yeah, just, just my concern. I know it's, five years, but 10 years, just wanting to make sure that somehow there's, you know, it's not just extended to be extended, mm -hmm. but that there's an analysis of why yeah. it needs to be extended if it needs to be extended. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So with that, I will entertain a motion to approve resolution number 6034. So move. <laughs> so I have a motion on the floor. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so motion carries unanimously. Thank you so much, sure. Leon Thank you. and Leo. <laughs> Good evening. Thanks, Leo. <laughs> Thank you, Leo. Okay, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is item B-2, a resolution number 6035, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Soledad approving and authorizing the City Manager to execute a land lease agreement between the City of Soledad and SAC Wireless, VDA Verizon Wireless, for approximately, approximately 625 square feet of space in Blossom Tana Park for the construction and operation of a telecommunications antenna and related equipment. So I will turn this over to an associate planner, Adriana Amora. Thank you. Um, so I'll be presenting resolution uh, 6035 um, for council consideration and approval. Um, so I'll, just, I'll, I'll present some background regarding planning commission uh, approval, and I know our uh, city attorney can provide more information also um, with background on the previous negotiations if needed. Um, so city council will consider a resolution to approve and authorize the city manager to execute a lease with SAC Wireless for a new wireless and tele telecommunication um, facility at Blossom Bennett Park on Gavilan Drive. 
Um, this is a public facility. It's a public facility in the city of Salina. Therefore, um, Verizon is, um, has to go through negotiations with uh, the city in order to install this um, model pie. The project has received conditional land use approval from Planning Commission. Um, the Planning Commission held public hearings on March 9th, April 13th, and November 30th. Um, residents within 300 feet of that low, at Black and Center Park were notified for the public hearings and for the opportunity to review the, the proposed project and no comments, public comments were received. Mm. Um, the project was granted a conditional use permit, um, which was provided among attachment three um, with specific conditions related to construction standards and design features. In a moment, I'll share um, the, the actual pictures for um, council, the pictures that were uh, attached to the staff report and for the um, those that are viewing us are able to see. Um, however, some concerns were raised about the proposed location and its proximity to its basketball courts. Um, in order to move that forward, Planning Commission unanimously approved the conditional use permit with the condition that the director was to approve the final site plan. Um, during that time, our city manager came in acting as a director and um, requested that the tower be relocated with um, the condition that it was away from the basketball court, so direction from the planning commission, as understood from the from from their action. Um, because of the topography, Verizon recommended that the modify be located closer to the intersection of Prado and that one, which I'll show shortly. Um, and uh, for that location, the planning commission expressed concern about aesthetics and impact of the uh, on that new location. Um, staff explained the part um, of the rationale for the new location is to limit potential conflict for the most active area of La Fontana, um, which is the recreational activities on the basketball courts, and also to allow future development um, in the park, future redevelopment. <clears throat> Eventually, the Planning Commission unanimously you know, recommended that the Monopoly be placed off to the side of the basketball courts, closer to the daycare facility. Um, however, the Planning Commission decided to delegate the final decision and location to the City Council as part of the review um, and consideration of the lease. Um, and with regards to the location, let me share my screen briefly just to show and provide more explanation. Um, okay. So this is um, provided on the attachment two. Uh, for Verizon Wireless. As seen here, okay, there we go. Location A is um, the Planning Commission recommendation to Council for approval of the final site plan. Um, location B is where um, the new requested location was uh, given um, by uh, the city manager due to the redevelopment opportunities of La Santana and um, the active recreational activities closer to location A. Um, and and um, through the chair, I just wanted to add, um, there's some concern about it being um, close to the daycare center as well and blocking views from the active area down to the soccer complex because a lot of parents will be on the top lot and kind of looking down to, to watch soccer or on the basketball court. So that the, that was also okay. uh, rationale for the new location. Thank you. Um, and then this is a site plan regarding location A, as you can see more of the specifics and also the easements that will be going if council decides this is the appropriate location here. Um, and then here, this is a brief uh, example of what it would look like from a standpoint of the basketball courts. Um, Planning Commission did provide a condition that the area is supposed to be landscaped, um, and um, that is what is being proposed on, on the design, as well as making it as uh, aesthetically uh, similar to the other related trees. So in this case, it will have a pine um, tree um, uh, design. <laughs> So then we have location B um, right here, which is a requested um, 
switch. Uh, we did bring that back to planning commission, and as mentioned, they preferred uh, location A or rec is recommending location A um, for council consideration, review and consideration. And as mentioned, this is an example of location B, which is on the Galway Drive in Prado. Um, one of the conditions staff is requesting if location B is chosen um, is to add additional trees along the strip of Prado driving um, Gavilan to make sure it does not offset the model prime um, and make it more uh, aesthetically pleasing or more um, uh, become uh, better integrated within the park. Um, so those are the examples there and I can pull them up if um, you want to reference them. In regards to the lease, um, Verizon Wireless is proposing a monthly rent of $2,500 um, $2, monthly annual. Uh, annual would be $30,000. Um, this will allow you lease area of 625 square foot equipment to service the antenna. Uh, which will be surrounded by a chain link fence and wooden slats have been appropriate landscaping for the planning commission condition. A variety of easements will also be provided to Verizon as well easements for related utility installation. Um, generally speaking, the proposed installation of antenna and equipment is similar to the antenna and equipment that are installed throughout other city um, uh, cell tower uh, locations such as Wasi Park. Um, as a property owner, the city of Solar would receive an annual $30,000 um, rental revenue by establishing a lease to operate the tower. Um, therefore, commencing on the first day of the first year, the lease Verizon shall pay $30,000 per year, with the rent being subject to an annual 3% lease. Um, at this time, staff is recommending approval of the lease, uh, which is provided in Exhibit A, um, with the site plan recommendation for location B provided that we shown uh, earlier, and with the condition that additional trees are provided along Prado Drive and Gavlan Drive. Again, adding those trees would um, help alleviate some of the aesthetic concerns Planning Commission had for Location B, um, and the City Council can review and consider both side plans upon final approval and execution of the lease. Uh, upon a adoption of this resolution and approving the site plan, the applicant can continue the plan review process. Uh, subsequent consideration and approval conditions is imposed on the site plan and review and approval for construction documents is still needed um, in order to comply with our city site plan review standards. Um, the proposed site plan will be consistent with our Solid Air Municipal Code chapter and um, based on the location, it should not be uh, detrimental to health, safety, comfort, convenience, um, or any other improvements in the neighborhood or general welfare of the city. Uh, regarding CEQA review, uh, we found it be exempt under section 15332 infill, uh, general rule, and 15303 accessory structures of CEQA guidelines. The project proposed has no value for endangered species, and there are no additional effects relating to no noise, air quality, and water quality. And if there's any questions, I'm um, happy to answer some. Thank you, Adriana, for that. Um, so let me take it out to the public first so we can hear from our public in regards to this item. And I know just for the public, this has been an item that the council has discussed, um, originally proposed, um, I want to say maybe eight years ago. Um, Mike, I think it's been a while now. So. Um, so I know there was discussion again. So, I mean, there was discussion before. So it, the council did have a, a lot of discussion then. And now we want to make sure that this is coming back before us. There's obviously some uh, differences in terms of the location now um, and the um, terms of the uh, grant agreement and the funding that's going to be awarded to the city. So those are two major changes. So it's coming back before us. So. Any members of the public that are here with us in our chambers wish to uh, comment on item or have questions on item B-2? First of all, I just want to thank Ariana and Simon. Every time I'm here, you know, and she's presenting something, she's very thorough. And I think that, you know, good word needs to be recognized. So thank you, Ariana. Um, I just have a cost about, you know, the trees, um, the additional trees. 
um, who would front that cost and what is the expected cost? Um, is it something that um, Verizon is willing to chip into or is that something that the city would be liable for? Um, so that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, uh, if condition or putting in conditions, the developer is responsible for, for those costs of the trees and implementing the conditions that are approved um, through council or planning con uh, commission conditions. So they are responsible to move forward um, in order to get a construction permit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, so let's take it out to those that are joining us via Zoom. Are there any um, members of the public that are joining us via Zoom that have any comments or questions? Okay, I do see a hand up. Um, so, uh, Mr. Paul Alberton, if you want to unmute and ask your comment or your ask your question or your comment. Oh, he's on the good. Good evening, uh, Mayor. And council members, my name is Paul Albert, and I'm actually the outside counsel for Verizon Wireless. And we wanted to let you know that we're here. I'm here also uh, with Michelle Duarte, who is also on the Zoom call, and to answer any questions that you have regarding the application. I did want to point out and uh, appreciate all the time and effort that the council has put into Verizon Wireless's effort to expand or provide adequate service for Soledad, a, a town of 20, over 20,000 uh, residents. We have only one tower and we'd like to have a second tower to help provide service to the community. Uh, Verizon Wireless and the lease that came to you about a year ago was showing uh, location A and we've worked forward and gotten approval under the uh, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. We've also uh, prepared, so done soils and engineering. And so uh, we are, if there is a selection, and I believe the Planning Commission twice now has voted uh, unanimously to locate at uh, Site A, our preference would be to move forward with Site A. We want to cooperate with the council and the community as, as best as possible and would be willing to relocate to Site B if that's the choice of the council. I do want to say that Michelle Duarte is available to answer any other questions you may have about the application. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Paul. And just can I just have a follow up in regards to? I know that there's a different proposed location because the location before us tonight is location B. Can you just share to for the council and the public why your preference for location A? Just be uh, simply because uh, we have prepared the uh, soils and reporting and the NEPA review and so forth. Uh, if we go to location B, we will have to redo the. Soils reporting, NEPA, other work. It'll delay uh, installation of the tower for uh, another six months at least in terms of construction. And we listened to the uh, comments of staff and the community in the Planning Commission in terms of their preference for the location. And I think their their concerns were uh, were uh, really, I think, more related to uh, aesthetics. Uh, be no concern, uh, I should say with the, uh, the daycare center in terms of compliance with FCC standards or exposure standards, the site with the antenna is so high up in the air is gonna be fully compliant with all FCC guidelines. I thank, hope that answers you your question. That. It does, thank you. I wanted to make sure um, our, our council and also our residents um, understood the preference um, for that site. So obviously there's already some um, preparation that's been done in regards to some of the um, environmentals. So obviously that's a big consideration uh, as well. So thank you for that. Okay, so any other members of the public that are joining us via Zoom? Okay, I see none. So then I will be, I will bring it back to the council for any comments. So let, let, any questions first and then we'll move into um, a motion, but any questions at this time from the council? in regards to this item. Through the chair, I have a question. I hate to do this now at the 12th hour. And I see we have the two locations, A and B. And I'm looking at the at our map of our city. And I, I'm, my understanding is that we want that second tower and then what would be the most aesthetic, pleasing area or less uh, noticeable. And I'm wondering why didn't we look at Lum or Peverini Park 
uh, right there with the water towers. And, and I know I should have brought this up a whole lot earlier than now, but um, it just it just dawned on me. We have the Santa Barbara Park, probably not appropriate, but I think the Lum Peverini area might be. Is there any reason we didn't look at those? Or we did look at those, and this is the reason why. Ooh, yes, thank you. That's a good question. So um, I, I think there was some back history in the past that was already tying to this place, but I know Verizon did conduct their studies on the different areas in the park, and maybe Verizon could talk more on behalf of that um, on, on the different park areas. Um, so uh, Paul or Michelle, are you able to answer that question? Michelle, you, are you on? Do you want to go ahead or shall I? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. So we did look at Pever Peverini Park and the other parks in the area, but the coverage goal and the objective is Soledad High School in the central area of downtown Soledad. Um, the other parks are too northern to reach and give adequate capacity and coverage um, goals for downtown Soledad. So originally we did reach out to Soledad High School as that is the main objective of um, so upgraded service and that did not pan out with the lease so then we went to the city of soledad for blas antenna park which is right next door it's pretty central to soledad and it would reach a lot of citizens working from home as well as the high school thank you michelle that answered my question thank you um any other questions um <clears throat> Because um, um, I know now that, that I know that uh, Verizon is there, I'm not sure that I, that I should say what I want to say. But I was thinking um, not just the trees, but uh, some sort of steps. Remember that uh, towards the uh, the side of the um, basketball court, there's a couple of steps where people sit, mm -hmm. but in the, on the other side, there is none. So maybe create some necessarily uh, cement steps, but uh, just... Uh, uh, kind of dig into the ground and, and use that ground to create like kind of three steps so that people can sit and watch the game on, or even to walk or or something you know so that that so that the park has increases their their interest to people. Mm -hmm. So um through the chair I think um the one thing we have to make sure is that there's a nexus between the project and what we're asking the developer to do. Mm -hmm. There is an aesthetic nexus um, and it, um, and possibly also an exhibit. Uh, there are two locations proposed. There's uh, location A, which is close to the basketball courts where there's already kind of a series of trees. Um, if council chooses to go with um, location A, there, there may not really be a necessity to put more trees because there are, but um, staff, uh, the staff recommendation of B um, along Prado, there's not really um, as many trees. And so to kind of make sure it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb and there's kind of a nexus there, we would add additional, we would propose adding additional trees so that it kind of looks like it's surrounded by other pine trees um so it may depend on the preference preferred location of council about that condition but we have to make sure that whatever condition council would want is there's a nexus between what they're proposing to do and um, a reason why they're mm -hmm. it's, it's like a mitigation almost mm -hmm. okay yeah from, from just to finish from from my from my part i really like location mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thank you, uh, Council Member um, Cabrera on that. I, I just have another just quick question so that way our folks understand too that um, site A obviously is the preferred site and that's where we wanted to have it. But site, I mean, at least there was discussion previously, but um, there was concerns and I just want to remind the public when we had this discussion many years ago, there was discussion, there's concerns and I know obviously, you know, there's, there's data that justifies that this is safe, right? But there was a lot of discussion in regards to having it in close proximity to the child, to, as was mentioned, to the, to the child care. 
Um, and then, so Megan, so this obviously this area where we're looking at in the um, in the in A is what the city. So we have plans to redevelop that area. We have plans to expand in that area. I mean, just yeah, so, we, so the public knows um, what, is, what is our our plans. So we don't have any um, set plans. We're in the process of doing a parks master plan and. One of the things that we heard thus far through the parks master plan is that probably the second to um, uh, maybe Vosti Park, um, Santana Plus is the most important park to the community. There's a lot of interest in making uh, more investments into the area. And uh, obviously that's hence the lights um, because it's very active. And there have been discussions about that portion of the park there's a volleyball court that's not really actively utilized so you know based on sort of initial feedback I would think that this would be a park that we would seriously prioritize um, in terms of looking at opportunities for redevelopment and because the active area is really on that shelf you know looking up towards the the um, field, which is actually also a detention basin. That's why, you know, we have some limitations of what we can do there. Um, that's the one area that's outside of the detention basin that you would actually have the most opportunity to redevelop and do different things with. But we don't have plans per se um, currently, but, you know, I, you know, thinking about limitations, we could work around the if it's the desire of the council to pick location A, we could work around the cell tower, but it just makes it easier if it's outside of that area to to be to have full use of that area that's above, right? On that kind of I call it a shelf, but you know that that's a flat area of the park that's not in the detention basin. Thank you, Megan, for that. So I just might my, my I just have a couple of questions, comments, and a question. So. One is I, I know that I don't want to, I don't want to forget to touch on this, but there is obviously revenue coming from this lease, and I want to make sure that as a council we look at those revenues. And I would like to bring this back on the revenue side, on the just to have a district earmark to district. Sorry, to have a city a city earmark um, for it to be for us to consider doing the mid year budget. Um, so that way, obviously, I want, you know, to make sure that this money really stays in our recreation and our parks goes back to, we've identified a couple of parks already, Veterans Park, obviously, that has to be improved. And even this park, right, what other elements can can be um, needed or are needed to be able to ensure that the revenue, the 30000 comes back to be able to have more recreation. Um, the other thing I know for me, and I had talked about it two years ago when we had the ARPA funds, was the basketball courts over at Vosti. You know, obviously we don't need the um, skate park anymore, so that's another opportunity for us to utilize some of this funding. But but I want that discussion to come back mm -hmm. in terms of the the set aside of those revenues. I just have a question. I mean, I'm okay with the B. Um, I just think, again, let's make sure that we have, if we're going to have the other trees on the, the perimeter of it, um, instead of, I know the drawing shows a big tree and then a bunch of trees around it, I think really having, because you already have off of um, Gavilan, you have the, the tree corridor, so I think if we can add more trees on that corridor, to make sure it's not just this big intrusive big pine, there's more trees around it, but there's also more trees on the other side. And I think that helps during the shade in the summer as well. So that way it looks more aesthetically better. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very highly trafficked corridor. So we don't want this big massive tree and a couple of other trees and it's very intrusive and the neighborhood obviously would be you know, upset. I think now that we have the big lights, you know, that's, I think it'll kind of even it out because we do have the big poles, right? That mm -hmm. you can't see and it's a different, so I think it kind of evens it out. But if I would recommend um, that we make sure that we have other trees on that line on um, Prado. on Prado. Yeah, so that way it doesn't cut off and it's a whole line of, of the trees. Um, and, and just for the public, I know this may not be something that people want, but 
as was mentioned, um, the whole focus of this is really to be able to provide more cell access, right? To solve that high school in the downtown corridor where we all know, especially during um, during COVID, I mean, cell reception is important. You know, we deal with issues already on our internet side, but this is just in terms of giving people the, the opportunity. And it's really important for us as we grow and develop to be able to have that accessibility. And I don't know, like, will this, will this is this portion of it, will there be a need in the future, Megan, to be able to, to have other areas that have this? Or are we covered pretty much in the city of Soledad with this tree being here? I, I think the nice thing is that there's um, a co-location opportunity. So um, the law encourages co-location on the same pole so you don't have, you know, mm -hmm. poles scattered without. But I suppose that when, if, you know, Maramonte moves forward, which we very much hope it does, there may be a future need uh, near near there. Okay, but for what we need right now, what our residents need right now, this would help with that this, coverage this, in that area. This will definitely help with the coverage. And I think, um, you know, uh, they, they've done a good job of identifying the best location in the city. And thankfully we're able to accommodate um, by being near the high school, which is the optimal location. Okay, perfect. So I, those are all my comments and questions. So with that council, I'll entertain a motion um, to approve resolution number 6035. Uh, um, the, and, the, and this is for location B, location B with the condition of the trees along Prado. Correct. And that's going to be absorbed by the developer. Mm -hmm. So moved. Okay. Second. So we have a motion on the floor. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So motion carries. Oh, any abstentions? None. Okay. So motion carries unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so we'll move on to our next item on our agenda, which is resolution D-3, a resolution of the city council, of the city of Soledad authorizing the city manager to execute an amendment to the affordable housing agreement between the city of Soledad and H um, HMBY LP for parcel E located on Santa Clara Street. And I will turn this over to our city manager. Thank you. So, um... We're very excited uh, to present this opportunity, which I think is kind of a win-win for us in terms of moving forward a vacant parcel um, that has been vacant for some time with um, housing opportunities across the, the um, income spectrum. Um, basically what um, the amendment would allow is um, would allow Eden Housing to step in um, to uh, take over the rental parcel and redevelop it uh, with very low and low affordable housing um, and increase the number of units. Hopefully they, they intend to apply for a density bonus, but this is kind of the first, first place, right? Right now uh, we would have, uh, we have 28 units that um, are entitled with that site, but uh, Eden Housing would look to, to actually create 40 uh, affordable housing units at the very low and low. Um, so this agreement would allow that type of partnership that would allow an alternate um, timing for Eden because um, as people who, are, who do affordable housing, it's very hard, it's very expensive to do, and it's very hard right now even to build market rate rental housing, to be honest with you. And it's much more difficult to build affordable rental housing, which is a huge need in the city. Um, so by separating it out, it would give Eden Housing time to apply for tax credits to help subsidize the development. The developer would um, provide the um, parcel, the rental housing parcel, for some uh, min minimal amount, maybe a dollar, that would be um, you know, ready um, as they will also be building some of the infrastructure around the parcel. And then the developer would be able to move forward with 104 townhomes, which again, it's kind of nice. These are more affordable by design housing units, even though 80 of them are market rate. Again, it's a different typology. It's a, it's a little less expensive than the typical uh, single family. And in addition, they would have 24 uh, units uh, 
offered at the moderate rate. So these would be great units to allow our working um, families who earn a little bit more uh, to get an ownership product. So um, that's essentially it. There's a, some minor amendments that would allow um, this timing al alternative so that uh, both projects can move forward on a, a somewhat of a different timeline. Um, we're very pleased too that Eden Housing has agreed to step in. They have um, gotten a grant for some uh, monies to put towards affordable housing projects and the board has um, earmarked uh, a little less than a million dollars to the project in Soledad. So that makes it even more, um, you know, more attractive and, and we'll be able to um, work together hopefully so that they can submit tax credits in summer of 2024. So that's um, that's the, the project essentially. And um, I don't know if the city attorney wanted to add anything in terms of the uh, amendments that he helped um, or he, took the lead in drafting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I think you covered everything. <clears throat> the the uh, Basically, the amendments are meant to facilitate this new proposed plan for the development and the uh, conveyance of the property to Eden House for the development of the uh, of the uh, affordable units. Um, and I, you may have mentioned, but I, I, I uh, may have uh, phased out for a second, but that one of the other benefits is that we will have more mm -hmm. affordable units than uh, had originally been planned. Eden Housing plans to as for a density bonus that will allow them to construct uh, 40 as opposed to the uh, the 24 that are currently authorized. So, And um, in, in total, we'll end up having 64 affordable units at the very low, low and moderate rate. So I think that's a, that's a great, great thing for the city. Thank you, Megan. Um, so before we bring it back to council, let me take it out to our public. Um, if there's any comments or questions from those that are joining us here in the chamber. Okay, then let me take it out to um, any of our, those that are joining us via Zoom. Okay, seeing none, then I'll bring it back to council for um, any final comments or questions. So let me start with council member Cabrera. Work this way. Um, no, I don't. Because um, uh, the only thing that I was uh, thinking about is that all of this are going to start building at the same time, right? Or uh, is there any preference? Or I'm just now I'm, I'm, I'm scared that they're going to leave the the lot for the for the um, the lower and, and medium um, uh, cost. To the very end, like we had before. So, so um, they they will not necessarily be on the same timing, but the intention of Eden Housing is to to, to apply for the tax credits. Okay. Um, in in the summer of twenty twenty four. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know I've worked with Eden before, and they're pretty aggressive. So if they are not successful with that one. Uh, you know, I'm confident that they will, um, you know, continue until they're successful. And I think this project has is would be attractive in terms of some of that tax credit process. So um, they, um, they it could be that the moderate and market rate units move first. It could actually happen that the um, the rental. Uh, portion moves first. It just it just kind of depends, or they could be almost cl closely tied together. So, but um, I know that um, Eden has offered to turn the property back to the city if they're not successful in securing tax credits in five years. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you, thank you, Megan, for that question. And just so the council knows, I know that was one of my concerns when we the ad hoc subcommittee um, had. Uh, two times, I think there was two different subcommittees that we had in one. That was my main concern is what happens if that doesn't get constructed because we've had that history in the past, making sure that we don't do that again. So guardrails would be guardrails were placed in to be able to say, hey, if in five years it doesn't happen, then we retain the right to take it back mm -hmm. and to be able to do um, to work with another developer to make sure that that does happen. Okay, thank you. 
Mayor Fulton? No questions. Okay. Yeah, and um, for me, I just want to thank um, want to thank the the, the developer, um, Leigh Aga. I know that you know he was part of the you know uh, heavily questioned um, housing subcommittee meetings. Um, also, Eden Housing. Thank you so, so thank you so much. I think this is a really creative way to be able to build housing. As Megan said, this lot has been sitting there for a long time. And I think for me, um, obviously there's no secret, I'm a big advocate for affordable housing. And one of the pieces that was really missing from our arena numbers and what the city has done in the past is being able to fulfill those lower income units that are really difficult to fulfill. So I thought this was a very creative way to be able to rethink how we do business, um, but still be able to provide you know, the units that are needed at a market rate, but also giving us more deeper affordable units and double of what was what was needed. So I think this is overall a really, you know, creative way of building housing. And I hope we are one of those success stories. So that way we can be a pilot and a model for some of the other cities in terms of how we can do this to be able to help cities create the housing that they need, especially at the deeper levels. So I just want to say again, thank you. Thank you for staff for working on this to making sure there was guardrails here and just so the public knows if it's successful in terms of achieving the tax credits and it does have a 55 year affordability component. So these units would remain affordable for 55 years, which is amazing. So um, with that, if there's no further comments and I'd like to make a motion to approve um, resolution B-3. Second. Okay, so I have a first and a second. All in favor say aye. Sure. Oh. I just wanted to correct. It's re resolution number 6036. Oh, sorry, I said B-3. <laughs> That's item B-3, resolution number 6036. Um, and so we have a motion on the floor with the corrected resolution number 6036. All in favor say aye. 36 and 37. 6036, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. okay. No. Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, any abstentions? Okay, so resolution 6036 um, carries unanimously. And I also want to make sure I acknowledge Councilwoman um, Coralejo. I know she's not here today, but she's also she was also part of the subcommittee meetings um, and really having a really important dialogue in terms to making this project feasible and making sure that it came back to the council for a recommendation for approval. Um, so thank you. So then with that, thank you so much. And we will move on to our next item on our agenda, which is item B-4. Resolution number 6037, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Solidan, approving and authorizing the City Manager to execute a billboard lease between the City of Solidan and Trucking Real Estate in EVA Legacy Signs for the operation of a digital billboard outdoor advertising sign. And I will turn this over to. Megan? Oh, to Ariana. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to do a brief presentation um, here. All right, so I'll do a brief presentation on um, the proposed lease that's being reviewed, that is reviewed by council and is um, going to be taken into consideration tonight. Um, we do have a representative from Legacy Science here. Uh, Thought in case there's any technical questions regarding um, the sign of the lease. Um, okay. So um, we we are bringing this forward to uh, uh, come into a lease agreement um, for a billboard digital sign at Los Coches Adobe um, location, which is a property that is owned by the city of Soledad. Um, before you know, there are some concerns regarding the location. Um, we anticipate it not affecting the historical value of the Los Coches Adobe. So we are working around and we'll show a side plan of how different uh, the distance between the, the proposed site and uh, Los Coches Adobe. Um, staff provided some examples here regarding the proposed designs um, that can be considered. Um, I believe within staff, this one is the one that is in most favor, which is something simple. It has our logo and information. Um, now, the proposed lease terms currently, there is a 50000 annual rent payment to the city, which is $10,000 per quarter. 
um, with a 10% rent increase every five years. 20% um, of the signed advertising space is available to the city at no cost, which is a value of $62,400. Um, so um, us as a city, we are able to take away some advertising, 20% of the advertising space is assigned for any city or government purposes, um, any emergency um, uh, notices or anything related to the city of Solida. So within this digital sign, there's up to 25 advertisements executed executions per year. Um, there isn't a limited creative execution for uh, emergency communications, law enforcement, fire, FBI wanted signs, and natural disasters, and so on. Um, so that is also provided there. Um, one unique item is that local solid businesses are able to cooperate with legacy signs, um, and they can advertise their business, so it can help um, local economy uh, advertise for their services, um, and they do receive a 25% discount. Um, on the on the proposed space for advertising space. Uh, this is a 30-year lease agreement with an app option of four five-year extensions, um, and all construction costs will be covered by legacy signs. Uh, the legacy signs sign itself is proposed to be 14 feet by 48, um, and it runs eight second spots in a 64 second loop. Um, Legacy sign is providing all the information that identifies the city perennial liability. Um, the operation of the sign, so there's already been some tests on the sign of Coaches Adobe to make sure there's appropriate connection before moving forward with a um, lease negotiation. So it does, um, there is an appropriate connection there and she will also conform with other state and federal laws regarding um, lighting on the sign. Um, legacy sign is dedicating to pay all development, construction, and operation expenses. And then the final site design shall be approved by the city uh, and be designed to city standards and codes. Um, one thing to note is that all the advertising should not include adult content, tobacco, cannabis, guns, political, or religious advertisements on, on this side. Um, <clears throat> one thing to note, the legacy signs have worked with other jurisdictions um, we would be um, included into the list of jurisdictions that the city is working for. Again, one of the things that really benefits the city is um, increasing tourism or advertising um, city um, tourist uh, de uh, destinations, such as the Gateway to the Pinnacles, as you know, it's, it's something that is really valuable to our local um, city and local economy ultimately. Um, also, there's opportunity to collaborate with other nearby wineries as we are close to a wine trails as well. Uh, but it's something um, we um, would advertise, or they could also come and advertise independently with that 25% discount with legacy signs. Again, this is just examples of what legacy sign is proposing regarding um, local businesses here in Soledad, as well as any uh, advertisements we may want to um, display in our uh, digital site if approved among council. Again, more um, information um, that can be displayed in this digital billboard um, with us having 20% of those uh, ads. This is a brief site plan of where it's located. It's located in the box area closer to Highway 101. Um, Los Coches Adobe is farther down closer to Arroyo Seco Road, which is uh, fairly ar across the parcel. So um, it does not interfere with the Los Coches Adobe. And based on the site um, uh, studies, it will not interfere the siting of Los Coches Adobe from this freeway. As you can see here, this is just a brief um, uh, picture of how it can look going down South 101. And then this is a picture going up north um, 101 um, along Highway 101. All right. And that concludes the presentation. I can leave any material up. Um, and uh, you know, our city manager can is open for questions. All right. I didn't mind um, showing the site where the location is again, the the um... <laughs> Uh, yeah, the plan.
but not, yeah. Thank you. It's the, the yeah. box area, the rectangle. If, if um, Ariana could circle it with her cursor. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to circle it so that it's clear. But yeah, that, that area right there. Yeah, that is the proposed area. Um, and Los Coches Adobe is where my cursor goes anywhere. There you go. Yeah, somewhere farther down the circle. It's just hard to see the cursor on the screen here. Mm -hmm. But um, ultimately, it's it's far far farther yeah. from from Los Coches Adobe. Yeah. Thank Thank you, Ariana. Thank you for that. So thank you so much for bringing that forward. I know we looked at this um, or talked about it for some time. So thank you for bringing that forward. Let me take it out to the public first before I bring it back to the council, if there's any comments or questions um, from those that are joining us here in our chambers, any comments or questions on um, item B-4? Well, <laughs> uh, I just, you know, something that's been pressing on my mind for a couple of years. Um, and it was brought up recently, and another um, my um, involvement in community activism, and that is the missing um, person, um, Anneli Garcia. And I know that they have been looking for an opportunity to post a billboard sign in a nearby area. And, you know, I just hope that we can consider helping the efforts of finding Areli Garcia. And um, that is it. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Any um, comments from those that are joining us via Zoom? Okay. So seeing none, then I'll bring it back to the council for any questions or comments on this item. And I'll start with Mayor Potem. Uh, Ariana, uh, the question regarding uh, the historical site of the Adobe, it doesn't uh, violate any of the restrictions placed upon the Adobe or we have with doing anything with the Adobe. Yeah, um, we did, uh, I did some research when we uh, obtained the property on the quick claim deed uh, when we received the Los Coches site. Um, the city has to preserve the historical building, cannot um, demolish it, it has to keep the historical value of Los Coches Adobe. Right. So, um, we believe that adding this digital sign on the property does not affect the structure itself. And that's the furthest we can get it away from it. Like you mentioned that that's along the mm -hmm. highway and it's more so the Roseca Road is the mm -hmm. Adobe over here. Mm -hmm. So there's further apart that we could possibly do on that site. Yes, I believe so. Okay. I believe that's the farthest that was, uh, the survey was done to accommodate the site farthest away. Okay. And then just a follow up that. Thank you. question from Mayor Pertem. So, I know we've talked about future, or what, obviously that it has for renovation or rehabilitation, it has, you know, it has to comply with the historical um, standards. But so for future, the, having the sign there, I know it's a little bit further out, but wouldn't impede um, any potential development or redevelopment or upgrades to that site? Mm -hmm. um, the, well, I, I did want to, um, mentioned that it still will have to be evaluated under um, CEQA. So there'll be some kind of making sure that it could be exempt. You know, it is in a, you know, because of the, it's not that close to the Adobe, but because of some of the views and stuff, it would have, there would probably have to be a study about how, the impact, but obviously um, the, um, developer in, this, in legacy science doesn't want to do all of this work unless council is um, willing to mm -hmm. enter into an, a lease arrangement. So there's additional work he'll have to do um, in order to construct the sign. Um, it, I don't want to say it wouldn't have an impact to redevelopment, but as you can see, that area where the triangle is gets pretty darn narrow. 
So it, you wouldn't probably be able to do it. It probably wouldn't impede it as that much. Um, so, you know, yes, me possibly, I can't say that it wouldn't not at all, but, um, it's, it's pretty, it, it's a pretty, um, limited area. And I think the one benefit of the sign is that in some future where we hopefully can, uh, revitalize Los Coches, you have an opportunity to advertise right near to it. Um, you know, the, the opportunity to come visit. So, um, you know, that, that is one of the challenges, but, um, I, I don't think it, it's going to be that impactful to the site. Okay. And Megan, it still has to go through the state historic preservation, um, the state historic preservation office because of the historic site. So they'll tell us whether it's, uh, whether they approve or not. Yeah. I mean, there's still, there has to be some evaluation. Um, you, you know, one thing that, um, a lot of times you can do construction on the site. Um, so, it, you know, having done a lot of historic preservation in my career, I don't know that there could be, there would be a finding that it would be impactful, but, um, given the distance and so forth, but yeah, it would be evaluated. Okay. And then my, uh, so my other question, sorry, just because we're on a historic preservation site and then I'll turn it to um, Councilman Rick uh, so, so have we consulted also, will it impact, I mean, it's far away from the fields, but have we consulted also with the property owner of the fields to make sure, I mean, we want it not to be obstructive to our land, but also to just any comments that we've had from the property owner. Mm -hmm. We have not caught, um, contacted the property owner. I think it's the Pazier family mm -hmm. that runs like they said, um, agricultural um, field. So we can um, definitely provide them a notice. They don't really need to do Yeah, I think it, it'll be important, especially because it'll be adjacent to their property. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, just to be in good neighbors, I think it's important for them to know yeah. and hear any of the comments. Um, so, okay. So, uh, Council Member Cabrera? Oh. <clears throat> No, I, I don't have any questions. I was going to suggest to go to there because you can see it um, mm -hmm. better. And it's almost uh, in front of the uh, exit. Yeah. So it was, uh, it's, um, I think it's a wonderful location, but uh, yes, we have to go. We have to contact our neighbors and mm -hmm. make sure that they know what's coming. Mm -hmm. And through the chair, um, it, we have a draft actually lease agreement. So we're seeking authorization for Mike and I to be able to finalize the, the form and um, some of the terms. Um, we did note that another city has um, some revenue sharing opportunity that we may or may not want to pursue also. Um, so that was something that we um, expressed. Yeah, that, that's correct. And so, yes, the uh, staff is asking you to approve the, uh, the lease. This evening is the substantial form and content and with the ability to make some some tweaks with respect to the uh, rent terms and and then hearing some of the concerns about the uh, the Adobe too would probably add some language to make sure that it's clear that this city has an obligation to maintain that particular structure and so that none of this can impact that in any adverse way, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. So there's some minor tweaks we we'll still need to make, but the baseline that we're using for the uh, the term of the compensation for the agreement is the fifty thousand and mm -hmm. and the uh, twenty percent use of the uh, the billboard itself. Okay. And so sharing tax, you mentioned tax sharing revenue. Tax yeah, so that would be with our sister cities, or no, not tax um, revenue sharing, but. Um, we know that there was a question about some of the lease arrangements um, in other jurisdictions and that there is a um, re an ad revenue sharing with um, some of the jurisdictions, but we would have to evaluate whether or not that's a better deal um, than a flat $50,000 um, lease term. So, um, Mike and I would have a little bit of flexibility to negotiate a a better deal. It would be no less than the fifty thousand, but if if there's a a deal that has the potential to bring more revenue to the city, we we would take a look at that. And 
Um, I know that the um, Legacy Signs is here and, you know, their deal is a little bit different with Lemon Grove. So we we would have to see if that if that would work because there's a risk that if we do some kind of revenue sharing and it ends up not being as profitable than kind of the flat lease, then it may not be worthwhile. Um, so, but we wanted to explore a little bit more to get the city the best deal possible. And then the grow is different too in Southern Cal or San Diego. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So uh, um, I just have a, two questions. One is who will review the content? So I know that there's content and there's a 25%, but do we review, does the city have the ability to review the content? That, so we might want to defer yeah. to the developer. Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, yeah, the content, we'll set some general guidelines in place, some kind of sort of guardrails as far as what's allowed, what's not allowable. And those are pretty clear. Um, no alcohol, I'm mean, sorry, no cannabis, no political, no religious, no adult content. And that way the advertising just kind of goes up more freely instead of for advertisers. And the city is protected, knowing that there's not going to be any uh, questionable content in the sign. Okay. And so my other question, because I know it was brought up, but also working with CHP, and I think it was part of the um part of the report as well. So whenever we have missing persons, I know we always have these signs, especially as you're going to Gilroy. You have the Amber Alerts, you have those signs up. We'd be able to, um, well, you'd be able to review the content and that's eligible, right? So if people wanted to, as well as said today, there was a missing person and there's, you know, um, that that would want to be advertised. Those are allowable uses, especially when it's individuals within our, our community. Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. You know, first and foremost, the communications platform and working with law enforcement, fire, the city. So whenever there's a, a natural disaster, a law enforcement emergency, um, sometimes, you know, minutes can be absolutely crucial in getting these messages out there. Um, so in the case of like an abduction, you know, we work with the FBI, we already have a template in place to um, fill out, you know, an image of the abductor, missing person, a phone number to call, descriptions and all that. And with the push of a button, this can go up and immediately get the message out to the masses. Um, it's a really, really critical um, and important uh, capability for law enforcement. Um, but while we're on the topic of emergency communications, you know, whether it's fire, flood, um, whenever there's something that's an emergency type of nature, communication need that needs to go up, all advertising ceases. And the only thing that's on the sign is that emergency communications message. So just know that this is a, something that the city and your law enforcement, fire, et cetera, can use. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you for that. I wanted to make sure we're clear on that. And then my my other question is in terms of aesthetics. So I know you showed us the preferred um, the the preferred kind of um, design, but I also want to make sure the design because we've I've seen and thank you for this because I've seen these throughout the different places that I've gone and. And they're really nice, but I think for some of it, sometimes it doesn't really fit the character of the community. And I think for us in Saudi, we want to make sure that it's fitting within the character of the community and that it's adding to what we already have. There was a lot of investment by councils before us in terms of the signs that, you know, you're coming in our entryway that we're keeping, you know, uh, a specific amount, a specific design element so that way we don't look all mismatched and everything looks different so i mean i know this is a good design but is there any way that it could be looking at some of the, the existing designs that we have already for the way signs and then the the two welcome signs coming into solid because they have a specific um feel to them and if can that be replicated in this structure yeah absolutely um you know the, the latest design the idea of that was to kind of keep the design of the structure as minimalistic as possible um but when sometimes the application of where the sign is going to be located at it can be positioned in a place that is able to be more of a landmark um so that people can see it as they're driving into your city um this particular location um could be used as either way um but i think i'll leave that up to uh, to staff of the city to uh, determine what's the best design for you. Okay, and, and I would, uh, through the chair, would just add that we probably want to consult a little bit with the state um, since it's proximity to the Adobe to make sure that 
um, whatever is put there is kind of least obtrusive to any sort of view um, that you might have in the Adobe, um, but also historically appropriate too, so that it's not a very super modern sign. Mm -hmm. So I think um, the idea that we kind of pointed out with some of the, I think you mentioned some of the wayfinding um, signs that were more kind of, maybe not exactly this, but had kind of a rod iron kind of simplistic look, but also traditional mm -hmm. old, you know, look historically appropriate. So, but any yeah. feedback that the council has, we have, uh, we can, you know, work with them and finalize that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Megan. I, I think for me and I'll, you know, just as long as it's, it, it, this is more, I mean, I know this is just design, but I think for me, that's what I would like looking at what we have existing and making it kind of seamless. So it doesn't look so mm -hmm. just, you know, modern. We're, we're, we want to be modern, but we also want to retain our historic sense. Mm -hmm. So I think just matching it with what's already within us. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, we can do that. Okay, any other final comments on resolution number 6037? Oh, Megan, and my last comment is, um, can this also come back? Because this is $50 million annually for over a 30-year lease period. So it'll be about 1.5 million total, right? Um, so can we bring this back also to be able to look at uh, if the council would like to do like a city earmark for those for that fund to go into like, you know, economic development priorities as well. So during the mid-year budget, can we can discuss you? that at a later time? Because I want to make sure that, I mean, I want, I know it's more money coming into the city, but I think it's important that we have these opportunities and we look at the priorities. Obviously, we have a list of things that we have not been able to do, but to utilize this revenue to really do a, a an earmark for a specific projects initiatives that are part of the goals of the council. Yeah, so um, you can do that. Um, each each budget year is a new new budget, so you wouldn't necessarily be able to put that in into perpetuity. But it, certainly, yes, through the budget, um, you can decide like this year we'd like to use this income, um, depending on the at which point we would start getting that lease um payment. Okay, so yeah, I just want that to come back so that way it doesn't get lost in our general fund budget, and then we don't we don't have any say on it. Yeah, for sure. I can um I can make sure that um like Howard does, and and we are going to be engaging in some um, budgetary workshops um with the community, so you know um we can bring that feedback to council too as you're considering some of that. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with that, if there's no other comments or questions, and I'll entertain a motion to approve item B-4, resolution number 6037. So moved. Okay, I have a motion on the floor. A second. I'll second the motion. So there's a motion on the floor. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. We're looking forward to having that digital billboard soon. <laughs> Okay, so we'll move on to our next item on our agenda, which is B-5, Resolution number 638, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Soledad, approving and authorizing the City Manager to execute a letter of intent with H -H -H -M -B -Y LP of a development to purchase a property at 540 Gavilan Drive and place a deposit of 10000 in an escrow account for the purpose of developing affordable housing in the future. I will turn this over to Megan. Um, so we're really pleased um, to to bring this letter of intent um, to the council. Um, you know, council's um, directive to me has been, you know, build housing, build more affordable housing, and uh, and create more economic development and improve the downtown. So those are kind of my um, the priorities. And so in looking at this opportunity. Um, the this, this city um, initiated its its housing element, so we're in the process of doing that. And as part of the housing element, um, we have to identify sites for housing. And uh, this site, um, 540 Gavilan, did have a, uh, was entitled to produce 96 um, units of housing, apartment-style housing, but only eight of those units were in the low-income 
categories and um, the the city of Soledad has been doing really good at, in moderate and above moderate units, but we haven't been re meeting our regional housing needs allocation in the very low and low income levels. So we have the opportunity to acquire this site and basically almost meet our entire arena um, with one project assuming of a, a similar density at this at, the, at this location. So initially, um, I think um, Aga Development had planned on moving forward with the project. Um, obviously, market conditions have changed. Um, we initially reached out to them about um, potentially purchasing the property, but it was out of our uh, range at the time. Um, they have um, subsequently approached us with uh, what we feel is a very fair um, offer um, and we're bringing it forward. We would use um, our housing successor agency funding, which is about 1.3 and then ARPA funds to make up the balance. Um, we did conduct, we just got the appraisal hot off the presses um, on the uh, on uh, December 12th. And um, the appraised value came in between um, 1 million, uh, 1.68 million and 1.776 million. So um, I negotiated a little bit down from what the asking price was to be the midpoint between those values, which is 1.728. Um, and it should be noted that the appraisal was kind of looking at other affordable housing projects. Um, it is kind of a, the, the price point. So, um, but also understanding the fair market value of that site. Um, we still do have to do the title report. Um, so this letter of intent is, is a non, um, non binding letter of intent um, pending giving us the our period to do due diligence. Um, we are asking to put forward $10,000 in earnest money. And my hope is that given that we already do have the appraisal, um, we could come back to city council with a purchase and sales agreement by uh, January 17th, um, assuming that we'll have the title report by then. And I think that's it. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, appreciate the report um, and all the efforts. Let me uh, take it out to the public first to see if there's any members of the public that have any comments on item or questions, item B-5, those that are joining us here in the chambers. Okay, those that are joining us, any comments from those that are joining us via Zoom? Okay, so none, then I will bring it back to the council if there's any, any questions um, or comments on this item, and I'll start with Council Member Cabrera. Uh, no, the the um, the only thing that I was concerned is with the, the number of people that would be added to that area, and if uh, that will have an impact with the uh, Jack Francione School and the population. Like I said before, the uh, uh, I believe that the school is uh, almost to that capacity, and there is no room for it. For extension of um to expand so just be um contact the school district to make sure that they they know and we start planning into that one so that we can accommodate this the, the future students of that the more students that we have mm -hmm. uh, megan that was so that was part of the housing element those because i know this was a property obviously that already had been approved for housing um, in the past. So it was already part of the um, assessment of how many units, I mean, that's already included. So it's not a new parcel with new people or new housing developments. It was already a housing development. Some of those impacts had already been discussed previously. I'm assuming, I know the school district was it's in front of yeah, it, but I know that it was discussion because it was already targeted to be a housing. It just hasn't happened. I mean, it's yeah. just been over 20 years, but that was already targeted for it to be housing. Yes, correct. It, it's, um, it, it has already um, has its plans and so forth and for apartment rental housing. Um, so it has been analyzed and um, 
uh, what is different is it wouldn't have been counted yet in our arena number. So um, if we are able to move forward, then we would get the credit because the building permits haven't been um, initiated. So it would count toward our fifth cycle or our sixth cycle? Sixth. Oh, it would. Yeah. Oh, great. So just for our sixth cycle, because they doubled the numbers of the arena numbers that the city has to, uh, um, has to at least on the affordability unit, it was 700 total, right? In the different so, mix. Yeah. So a little bit over 700, I think, on the sixth cycle. And the, in the very low and low income categories, we have to provide 165 units. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, any more questions? No. Okay. Uh, Mayor Platan? Thank you for letting me join here on the conversation. Uh, what's exciting about this is uh, thank you for being creative and, and seeking this out, Megan. Um, we had this project sitting there for the longest time, and now we're going to move forward. Uh, the good part is that we're going to address some critical issues in our community, which is housing and, and being able to have uh, a place so people can rent. There's no rental units around, uh, in addition to the other project on Santa Clara with Eden Housing. Um, starting to really address our, our issue and our people's concerns. Um, and hopefully will lessen the need for uh, current landowners to build ADUs. And maybe uh, that would start to slow down a little bit mm -hmm. as well. So um, um, it's good to see, and I'm excited about seeing the project move forward and that it's checking all the boxes for us to not only for the community, but also for our arena uh, numbers as well. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And and I wasn't excluding you from the conversation, just to make that clear. Thank you, Mayor. So I will move on with, um, you know, just, I don't have any questions, Megan. I just want to say thank you again um, for making sure that we are meeting. And not just because it's something that we need to meet as part of the state requirements under RENA, but I think it's something that we know as a council, when you look at the housing elements and you look at the data that's in there, the data clearly shows that the deficiency in terms of the housing that the city has been providing is really in those lower, very low, low income numbers. So it's it's a matter of a win-win where we're meeting the state requirements, but we're also meeting the, the needs of our community members in those lower income pockets that is, you know, documented in our general plan, documented in our housing element. So Thank you for finding this a creative way. And thank you, I also wanna say um, thank you to the Aga Development and they thank you so much for you know, being a partner. I, I know that you know, there's, we can say a lot of things about you know, different developers and whatnot. And, but I just wanna say thank you because I think this last kind of couple of years, it's just been really interesting to see how there's a different perception in terms of how we can really support each other, right? Support the city, support the developer, and the developer support the city to meet its goals. So I think, again, this is a creative way of, of doing this. And hopefully we also find, you know, that the city becomes a model for other cities and how we can work with our developers to meet our goals, but also to make sure that our residents have the housing that's needed within our area. So I want to say thank you to both. And, and through the chair, I did also want to acknowledge at least father Nader who came to me and um really was willing to work with us on on this project. So um it was it was great that he um he he took a haircut on this and uh is willing to help us move the housing forward. So thank you to Nader as well. Yeah. Th thank you. So with that then I'll entertain um uh, um motion to approve resolution so sixty thirty eight. So I have a first on the floor second, second. So I have a motion on the floor. All in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> any opposed? Okay. Um, any abstentions? None. So motion carried. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Lady, for you. being here. <laughs> okay, so we'll move on to our next item, which is item B-6, Mayor and Pro Tem appointments to measure S citizen oversight uh committee. And I will turn this over to Megan. Sure. So um the mayor and the mayor pro tem have uh, appointments that they can make to the measure um, S committee. I know that um, we do have um, one application mayor um, expressed wishing to have a youth representative and Rodrigo has um, put his name forward. Uh, and also uh, mayor pro tem expressed um, 
his his choice for uh, Measure S, which is um, Phil Nickerson, I, Correct. I believe. And so we just wanted to give you the opportunity. You don't have you don't have to move forward with them tonight, or you can move forward with them tonight. But we we uh, put it on the agenda so that you can um, decide, or or if you want to bring it back um, to a future meeting, that's okay too. I just have a clarification. I know I saw the the application for Rodrigo. Did we have an application? Maybe I missed it for Phil Nickerson. Um, there's that? yeah. So I don't know that there's necessarily an application uh, required um, when they're the individual. We've we've had not necessarily always had applications when appointments have been made when they're made by a particular individual. Also. Okay. Okay, well, then with having said that, then let me open it up to the public first before I bring it back to the council. If there's any members of the public that uh, wish to make a comment on item B-6. Okay, so I'll take it to those that are joining us via Zoom. Any members of the public that are joining us via Zoom wish to make a comment on item B-6? Okay, seeing none, then I'll bring it back to council. Um, so, this is an appointment of the mayor pro tem and myself, so I will I um, will defer to uh, Mayor pro tem first to make his any comments on that or no comment. Uh, just well, yes, comment. Uh, look forward to uh, to Phil Nickerson bringing his expertise, his his uh, community <laughs> involvement, his business sense, and uh, helping work with the city on on uh, on the Measure S committee. And he's looking forward to it, so I'm looking for his participation. And his attendance, because that's one of the issues uh, with uh, with all our uh, SNY committees. But uh promise that he would be there, and I expect him to be there. So thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. So I will move forward also with my recommendation for Rodrigo. And Rodrigo, thank you for completing an application, <laughs> even though um, it wasn't necessary. But thank you so much for doing that. I'd like to move with that recommendation as well. And I know the voice of the youth is really critical. So being able to have someone on that net. Measure S um, committee is really important for us to be able to have that lens of our youth. But I do want to say, Megan, I know there's been a, a lot of discussion because this board hasn't been able to meet because we had a lot of no shows. And I just want to make sure that we, as this is the Measure S committee is moving forward, that we are implementing and there's oversight of people are not attending, that we need to make sure they're removed when they're, I think there was like a three time that they don't attend. Um, so that way we don't continue to have the problem that we've been having, that if they're not attending, then that they're removed and that they know clearly you have to be here. And if it's not an excuse, um, you know, if it's not excuse, then it's going to count mm -hmm. against you. And then that it comes back to the council to let us know your representative hasn't been attending and that way we can make another appointment instead of waiting for this whole process and then there's no consensus on the measure as committee and then we also talked about it, and I want to make sure we don't forget about the onboarding and making sure that uh, measure as committee members that are coming on understand what their responsibilities are that they have already the calendar of the potential dates of when they're going to meet so that way they can put them on their calendar and we're not that they know ahead of time that this is their commitment and if they can't attend, that they need to let them know ahead of time. But I think the onboarding piece, because I know there was a lot that weren't really clear in terms of, okay, you know, what is my responsibility? And so especially because we have our youth, I really want to make sure that they understand, you know, how important their voice is and, and what Measure S um, is supposed to do. Um, and then just that we're on Measure S, I know I had talked about before, having also our community, a little pamphlet in my head, I just didn't bring it. But, you know, where we can send out to mm -hmm. to our community members, you know, kind of like that dollar bill that the state mm -hmm. does is, hey, this is where our measure S dollars go. Here's, you know, where it's allocated. And here is also for our measure Y opportunity so that where our community also knows this is where the tax money is going to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think when we're planning on working on something um, in early in the new year um, with um, finance and uh, Jesus uh, community engagement. And um, yes, we can um, work to do better onboarding. Um, the first, the next measure S committee meeting is tomorrow. So um, it's pretty quick. So we'll just make sure that um, 
if you want to make sure your appointment knows, <laughs> um, and Rodrigo will uh, follow up with him as well. Um, what time's the meeting? Six o'clock. And then I did want to also mention that um, Lorenzo Sanchez, who is um, who who was uh, appointed to the Planning Commission, won't be able to serve on the Measure S committee meeting because they a lot of times the meetings actually conflict with the Planning Commission. So um, he, uh, that is um, Council Member Coralejo's appointment to replacement to make so she'll have someone to. Uh, point and then we have uh, we also have a vacancy for Chavez so we're holding that open is it we're holding it until we get a yeah March. Okay. Off, after March so I just wanted to make uh, council aware of that okay th thank you for that okay so then we'll move on to our next item which is B-7 discuss and consider providing authority for council or any member uh, are any members to prepare an argument in favor of ordinance number 765? And I will turn this over to our city attorney. Yes, uh, Madam Mayor and Council, uh, as you are aware, on Friday afternoon, the city council adopted uh, resolution 6029, which basically was a response to the referendum petition that was received. And by way of the resolution, the matter of whether or not seven uh, ordinance 765, which established the five district voting system in the city should uh, continue or not. That question will be posed to the voters. Um, and so one of the things that's embedded in the elections law, as well as the resolution that we adopted is the opportunity for the parties on either side of this particular issue to write a um, an argument in favor or against uh, the uh, the actual action that's going to be on the ballot. Um, we have been in contact with folks who are, uh, we believe are, um, who were uh, instrumental in getting the petition uh, for the referendum signed and uh, that they are working on uh, something that may be submitted tomorrow, tomorrow being the deadline. But out of due diligence, um, we also recognize that we needed to come to the council and see whether or not the council was willing to uh, designate anybody um, on the council to actually write a argument in favor of ordinance 765. I recognize that uh, the council is split on this particular issue. So it's very unlikely we were going to have anybody designated uh, to write the uh, opinion of the council as a whole on this particular matter. But it is clear that there are uh, at least two council members who were in favor of keeping uh, ordinance 765 in place. And the council may, if they do decide to do so, they have the discretion to do so this evening, authorize one or both of those members of the council to write an argument in favor of Ordinance 765. You can do that by way of a, a simple motion this evening if you're so inclined. Okay, thank, thank you for that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if um, there's any comments. Uh, well, let me open it up. Let me take it up to the community first <laughs> for comments. So, any members of the public want to? Uh, on item B-7 or have any questions, comments? Um, well, I'm Monica again. Um, I'm one of I'm a spokesperson for the Solidarity Committee for Voting Rights. And um, we are preparing a statement. And I, since this is an issue that is very tender and very delicate to the city, I suggest that um, any op, um, opinion um, written in favor of be done on its own, not sanctioned through the, through the city, and that it be maintained neutral. At least, you know, like um, that the city stays neutral on this issue. So Thank just you. just for clarification, one of the things that I am tasked with doing is preparing an impartial analysis of the uh, ordinance to put into the uh, the voter pamphlet. That's where these arguments will be. And so I am tasked with actually preparing the impartial analysis, the neutral position, which will basically just set out, this is what the current ordinance does. This is what will happen if the measure passes. This is what will happen if the measure doesn't pass. So there, there already is going to be that uh, contained in the voter pamphlet. Okay, so that's an impartial analysis. So just to clarify, because I know when I was reading the ordinance, I was reading the document, the council report in 2003, when the council took it out to the public um, or put it on the ballot for the mayor election, um, there was, there was, um, 
designated of council members uh, that wrote that statement. So it is, it, it's a council member that needs to write those statements if we designate tonight sure. or- So oftentimes like um, a, an entire council will be in concert on a particular item and they will then designate rather than have all five council members meet and write something, which would be a violation of the Brown Act, they will designate one or two members to write something that is you know, either in support or opposition to a particular ballot measure and so forth. But in this particular case, um, again, because of the fact that there is no agreement as to what should happen to the uh, this particular ordinance, um, the council has the ability to still have uh, an argument appear in the uh, voter pamphlet, but it would be written by, um, you know, those members, one or two members of the council who were in support of Ordinance 765. Okay. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, so with that, I'd like to make a recommendation then. Obviously, we know that there's a split, but I'd like to make a recommendation that Mayor Pro Tem um, Jimenez and Councilwoman Corralejo, if they choose to do so, um, be those individuals to do the um, right that statement in favor it's of- a, It's an argument in favor of uh, maintaining uh, Ordinance 765. Mm -hmm. Unless there's any um, questions or you have any comments on it. Mayor no, Pratt. thank you, Mayor. Uh, without a doubt, yeah, we, we can do that as well. And, and we'll take up the comment and write that. that right. And just, just a reminder to everyone to make Darling's life easier too. So the deadline for this is tomorrow. Um, and the sooner Darling get it, the better. Um, you know. Yes, yeah, doing at five o'clock, but there are numerous other people stuck doing at five o'clock. So <laughs> right. It would be appreciated. Yeah, it would be appreciated if we could get it in well in advance of, yeah. of that five o'clock deadline because we then have to turn around and transmit it to the elections department. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Through the through the chair, um, one of the concerns is that uh, the the one in favor of the referendum has had more time to prepare this, and now we got a window about this far. Uh, open so um yeah there's no we don't have any that's that's out of our control so the the actual um deadline for the submission of the arguments is set by the elections department itself however the notification through the chair again however through the notification should have been uh, made at the passage of this or the act, it's in the it's in the resolution it actually specifically says city attorney may and then it says persons filing a referendum petition may file a written argument against Person, the city council may, you know, upon authorization file. Okay. So, yeah. yeah so right. it's, uh, Thank you. Yeah. So it was in the report. So just to clarify, there is no advantage here of one side or the other in terms of submitting the information. So, I mean, I, I want to be clear because it's not like, well, they had an advantage. So now they're going to have time to prepare while well, we did it. And it was in the council report when it was approved. So the comments could have made there and it could have been designated at that time. And it wasn't. So I just want to make that clear. So with that, if we're um, in agreement, um, the chair, I was uh, wondering when, um, when, when we put all these three uh, statements, uh, um, the statement, the neutral statement will say CD or does it have uh, the author or? I have to sign the yeah. impartial analysis. Right? So um, in this case, uh, Major Portem yeah. will sign yeah. as well. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there, are specific, there are specific forms that, okay. that have to be submitted in terms of who's signing and so forth. Um, and I think that those have been provided to uh, to the uh, the referendum group. And mm -hmm. um, we can provide the same to you. Uh, I'll get on it yeah, right now. Yeah, right. And so, and but yeah, I have to sign the impartial analysis. All right. Thank you. All right. Okay, so um, with that, then uh, we'll move on to the next item. Right. Do we want to take a vote on vote? that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so we yeah. will uh, take a vote in approving uh, council so, member of uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem um, Jimenez and Councilwoman Corralejo to work on preparing the argument in favor of Ordinance 7065. So, do we not take a motion, or just we're we're in agreement? We're in agreement. Yeah, this we're is in agreement for this to move forward. Yes. Okay. okay. Perfect. So then, future agenda items, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I got a lot of things I got to do right now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, no, uh, not sure. You, no, you, did, you had um, <laughs> mentioned about the complaint. I didn't know if you wanted the complaint mm -hmm. to come. Um, the complaint about the misinformation. 
From Mr. Sandoval. Oh, from Mr. Sandoval. Oh, from Mr. Sandoval. Um, if you wanted to discuss that in closed session or. Yes, I will I would like to do that for a closed session next year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and I just have one item under future agenda items. I, you know, we've been hearing a lot about neighborhood disputes, complaints, you know, code enforcement, um, police department. Um, I know our police department has tried to do as much as they can to really address some of these neighbor neighborhood or neighbor complaints and issues. Megan, so I, I know I want to make sure that our community understands like what are the resources available when there's neighbor disputes and how much can the city really do? What's within the city's jurisdiction? And then what is what's without our, our jurisdiction? Because I, I want to make sure there's clarity and somehow if we can um, address some of those, put something together where there's some kind of guidance for our neighbors and for us as a council, when we're getting a lot of these um, concerns and we're hearing these on social media and all of these things. Yeah, like a lot of misinformation. I want to make sure that we combat some of that with saying, hey, this is what we can do to address disputes based on, you know, what's within our control and then what is not something that we can do, right? I mean, if it violates a noise ordinance, okay, well, there's something that we can do. But if it's something totally different and neighbors just don't, you know, there's other issues happening. I, you know, there's more and more of that that I'm hearing. So if we could do something to put something together and then maybe have like a, you know, workshop or town hall or something about, hey, here's how we can handle this. Um, what resources are available within the county and what's not available? Yeah, I think we could do, um, I think we wanted to do something uh, regarding code enforcement similar to the truck, um, food truck thing. Um, probably not January 17th, but maybe the first meeting in February. Um, on the neighbor dispute, we could even come, that's a little bit different. We could maybe um, have a verbal presentation on the 17th about some tools. Um, I think that that would be good. Um, and um, in terms of the town hall, um, we'll have to we'll have to come back and, and think about um, what the staff resources would be. Yeah. So maybe let me defer. Maybe town hall is not necessary. If we could do some tools and resources available to our residents and how they can go about addressing this and what is city responsibility, what we can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. So that's clear. Yeah. We okay. We could, we could do something, and then if there was some follow up that's needed later. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. So with that, then, if there is no other items on the agenda, I want to make sure that this is our last council meeting for mm -hmm. uh, for this year. So we want to wish our staff and our community, um, everyone else, we want to wish you a happy holidays, happy new year, Feliz Navidad, Prospero Año, um, and hopefully everybody has a great time. And we'll see you here January 17th for our next meeting. This meeting is adjourned at 8.00.